eastern hemlock uh, between the months of November and May, uh, April here in Tennessee. There are a number of different hemlock types around the world, different types of trees, about 10 of them that they have found. Uh, you can see on your screen over on the in the United States over on the eastern side, we've got the eastern hemlock uh, and we also have the Carolina hemlock. Um, we don't have much of that here in Tennessee, just kind of along the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. But if you look, we also have native hemlocks out west as well. We have two uh, different species there. And then across the world, there are other species of hemlock. So the hemlock really adelgid is actually uh, a non-native pest here. Um, however, it has evolved with other parts of hemlock all over the, or other species of hemlock all over the world. The one that we're dealing with here in Tennessee uh, is, we have found, uh, researchers have found through genetic testing that it, it comes from Southern Japan. Um, and so that's important to remember as I go through my slides here. It was first detected here in the United States somewhere around Virginia. You can see that map on there somewhere around the 1920s. Um, and it became an obvious problem um, as the years went on. And it was detected as an obvious problem in the 1960s, 1970s. Here in Tennessee, uh, we found it in 2002. Um, of course, we were warned by North Carolina because North Carolina got hit pretty hard and quick. And as Jesse Webster can attest to, the Smokies got hit pretty hard pretty quickly as well. And so what you see on, on the screen there is the map of progression uh, across Tennessee. So currently in the state of Tennessee, basically all counties in which um, is in the native range of eastern hemlock has hemlock woolly adelgid. But it's important to recognize that you're not going to be able to see hemlock woolly adelgid on trees all of the year round. And that is mostly because of the life cycle of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Before, when I mentioned when I showed you that uh, picture of hemlock woolly adelgid on trees, that's usually in its most fluffy state, right? And so that's when it's an adult and it's laying eggs at the base of the needle on the underside of the tree. And that's usually can be seen between the months of November and May here in Tennessee. And that varies a little bit depending on temperature. Um, you'll see on your screen the life stages of HWA. There is a life stage in the summertime, months of June through October, uh, where they are not really seeable by the naked eye. You'll have to take rip off a piece of hemlock, put it under a pretty good microscope, to see them because they're really, 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 really tiny. Um, and in that stage, what happens is they go uh, at the end of May, they move into what's called the crawler stage and they crawl around on the tree and find a, an empty needle base that no other HWA is sitting on. And then they go to sleep. They basically go in hibernation, but in entomology world, we say estivation. And so they stay in estivation as long as it stays hot right so once it starts getting cooler that's when they start waking up and stretching and and going through their life stages to eventually going through the nymph stages to become an adult that lays eggs each adult can weigh some or can lay somewhere around 200 eggs so <clears throat> if you look at this slide you can see that at the base of every needle you basically see an adult um, with the nuva sac, that's that cotton waxy fiber that they create to protect themselves and their eggs. In each nuva sac, there's an adult and about 200 eggs. So as you can see, infestation can actually explode even with a just small number of HWA on the trees. That's why it's really important to remember that if you do go out in, in your trees during the months of October and June, and you do happen to see on the underside of the tree this then you know that you'll probably want to start thinking about doing something this is what early infestation looks like hwa what they do is they sit at the base of the needle um, on the hemlock trees and they stick their tongue in which is called a silus their tongue goes into kind of like this slit layer into the branch from the needle and they start sucking out nutrients from the tree our hemlocks, eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock, do not have any resistance built up. They did not um, evolve with HWA, and that's why it's a non-native 
uh, invasive species here. And so usually from the time that you have infestation happen, it's about four to 10 years before that hemlock dies if you don't do anything. And why is it four to 10 years? Well, that depends on growing space and the health of the tree. So this is what early infestation looks like. HWA love new growth. They love um, fresh needles. So most of the time when you're looking at your tree, if you look at the newer growth, which sometimes in the spring and then the following fall winter is that the tips, you'll see that that's where the HWA are. And so this tree, you'll see that every needle basically has uh, one of the Nuva sacs on there. Um, and the tree basically looks healthy, uh, but just know it's being attacked pr pretty strongly. Middle to late infestations. So on the left, you'll see uh, middle infestation, uh, not as many HWA uh, nuva sacs, and that's due to the tree being in decline. So the food really isn't that great for HWA. Good news uh, for us as far as not wanting HWA, bad news is because the tree is in decline. If you look, you can see that some of the buds are dead. Some of the needles have changed color. A lot of the needles are gone. Um, this is uh, a tree in middle to late inf or middle of infestation. Late infestation kind of looks uh, like what you see on the right. Uh, the tips of the branches are all dead. All those needles have fallen off. Discoloration in the needles, not much any needles left. Uh, sometimes you'll see secondary insects there. You'll see that spittle bug um, on the branches sometimes. So this is what late infestation looks like. Um, not really healthy for the tree. So that's a little bit about HWA. So now what I'd like to do is talk about uh, integrated pest management. As I was saying previously, whenever you have a forest pest, usually you, you want to go about it in a um, formula fashion, meaning A plus D or A plus B plus C equals management of pest. And so what is uh, integrated pest management? I'd like to offer you guys who are interested about hemlock woolly adelgid, a resource that came out a couple of years ago by some of my colleagues that work um, uh, for the US Forest Service. And this is an integrated, um, it's an IPM basically for resource managers, but homeowners can also use it. So please share this information with others. It was created by the US Forest Service. Um, and so part of my information that I'm going to share with you guys today comes for that. So what is integrated pest management? It's, it's much like what I just said. You're kind of taking all the tools that you possibly could have in your tool belt to fight this pest, which equals management um, and best practice management for your forest or whatever um, agricultural field that you're trying to work with. It's an effective environmental sense, sensitive approach that relies on combination of common six sense practices. Um, you and we use current comprehensive information on the life cycles of pests and their interaction with the environment. So here you can see on the screen another visual of those of the life cycle of HWA um, on the right hand side. One of my um, uh, community members who's working hard to conserve hemlocks in his community. That shows you the crawler stage when they're just getting out of estivation. You can see kind of a waxy layer starting to form around their little football bodies. Um, that's what they look like under a microscope. So clear you're not going to be able to see that if you just flip over your hemlocks. A lot of people say, I don't, Jackie, I don't have HWA on my hemlocks. And then that's when they call me in August. Right. And I and I'm like, well, uh, you're not going to see them right now. You might see them, you know, in November. It's a um, so integrated pest management is um, in combination with available pest control methods. Um, and so you kind of like I said, you kind of use as much information as you can, uh, which includes trying to figure out what is the the what provides us with the most effective and efficient method to manage this pest without causing the most harm to people, uh, property and the environment. And sometimes that does take um, sometimes that path does take us to use uh, chemicals. One of the main chemicals that uh, hemlock woolly adelgid management 
um, it, one of the chemicals we use is called imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid. There's also another neonic called donatefron, which we use. Um, however, the HWA strike team, which travels around the state of Tennessee, Cumberland Plateau and East Tennessee, they use strictly imidacloprid. And that's due to the efficacy um, and how long the tree is protected for. With imidacloprid, it kind of is this a similar natural chemical in the tree called olefin. And when hemlocks are treated with this imidacloprid chemical, it triggers an increase in olefin production. And so it's the olefin production that gives a three to or five to eight year um, protection for the tree. Again, depending on the health of the tree, level of infestation and uh, growing site. There, and then finally, um, one of the other methods that we use is biocontrol. Uh, a lot of people get kind of nervous when we talk about biocontrol. However, uh, due to our experiences in the past, the big hour, the big we, uh, we've come up with a plan. Uh, most of these uh, 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 biocontrol agents that we use are beetles and silverflies. Some of them have come directly from the Western United States, which um, we find that management of HWA in the Western United States um, is mostly biocontrol. Uh, and we also went to, we, the big we, went to Southern Japan, uh, specifically to the area where our HWA comes from and got uh, Laracopius osakensis, which is a beetle that is a specialty beetle. It, it specifically feeds on hemlock woolly adelgid. These biocontrol agents are stuck in a lab for six months in quarantine and they're fed everything that they could possibly be fed to make sure that they're specialty predators, to make sure that they're going to hone in and specifically try to manage HWA for us. So that's a little bit about uh, integrated pest management. So on your property, what does that look like? Well, I drew this pretty picture for everyone um, with uh, Microsoft Paint. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so what you have here is a pretty piece of property with a bunch of hemlocks on it of different sizes. And you find out that you have HWA on some of your trees. So you decide that you're going to go in there and you're going to treat with a uh, water soluble packets, metacloprid, you're going to treat some of your trees. So those blue dots represent the trees that I've decided to pick out that I want to uh, save. Now, because I love the trees by the river and I can't use the soil drench method uh, to treat these trees, I'm going to inject the trees by the river. Same chemical, imidacloprid, different kind of mixture, but tree injection means that I can use this chemical liberally with tree injection, whereas I can't with soil drench. So I treat some of my trees with uh, tree injection. And then I talked to Jackie Broker with the Tennessee Division of Forestry, and she told me about biocontrol and where I could possibly uh, look around to see if I could get some uh, beetles to release in my trees. So I go spend, you know, some cheap change of $5,000 and I get myself about 500 bees or beetles and I bring them and I release them um, throughout my stand. And so that that uh, and I'm making jokes here and being kind of funny. Um, so the the yellow dot there represents the, the beetle releases. But as we all know, you can't always keep a plant or a tree or a person alive forever. So some trees are going to die. Now they could have been trees that I treated. Um, and maybe it just didn't work out for the trees. Maybe they were too far gone. Um, maybe, uh, you know, some other agent came in and killed the trees off. So what, what do we do with our dead trees at that point? Well, we could turn some of them into wildlife trees. Leave some of them standing so that woodpeckers and owls might possibly make homes in them. But then you could also remove some of the ones that have died to make way for planting. And so this is maybe regeneration or hopeful management of your hemlock forest that you love so much um, and you want to see continue. That was my really quick, short presentation. Um, Hannah had told me that she really liked this presentation that I gave before. So I had hoped to do a shorter version, which Hannah, I think I, think I accomplished that. Um, so at this point, 
Would anybody uh, care to ask questions? I know that we have all the participants muted, but again, feel free to use the chat to ask any questions. Yeah, Bill, thank you about the drawing. I had a, I was laughing the day that I created that. It was a lot of, it was a lot of laughing and fun. You know, you got to have fun with your, with your job. So I know I went through that rather quick. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of us here are probably familiar uh, with Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, so. Um, Sean, it is not easy to get beetles. Um, right now, as far as I know of, for the private sector, I think there's maybe one person or two people, one in Pennsylvania, one in North Carolina, um, that uh, that might be able to sell beetles. But it's not it's not really easy, um, and it's five dollars a beetle, so it's it's actually really expensive um, to go that route. I will say that uh, throughout the nation, um, labs are rearing. Uh, Laracobius nigrinus, Laracobius osakensis, and the silver flies, which is Leucotraxis, uh, Pernaperda, and Argenticola. And those are, are the, the biocontrol agents that we are releasing all over the um, eastern seaboard um, in, in hopes that those populations will increase and help us with management of HWA. Has there been a difference in success between soil drench and injection? No, actually, Kendall, I have not seen um, a difference. Uh, the only difference I think that I could mention is that uh, with soil drench, you you cannot treat right next to the water. Um, you should not. It's against the law. Um, you have to do at least 10 feet. I know that uh, some of the Forest Service places do 10 meters. Uh, but you have to do soil drench away from the water. So the trees that are that are usually skipped because of using soil drench, um, you could definitely use uh, tree injection, and uh, that's better. We've also seen uh, the similar thing with basal bark application. Some people use basal bark application, and they see the same uh, efficiency and efficacy of using metacloprid um, to protect the tree. So uh, those are all really good things. Uh, there were some beetle releases done in Anderson and Warren counties on property owned by the Coal Creek Company about 10 years ago. Um, has there been any follow up to see if they're still active? That's a great question, Brent. Uh, we tend to uh, in the in the research realm, right? We tend to falter a little bit in our surveying and monitoring after that we after we've done stuff, and so. We, the big we, um, have been trying to do more surveying and monitoring. So part of the HWA strike team, what they do is they go out and beat trees around these locations. So if you see a group of four people out there with a stick whacking the heck out of a hemlock tree, um, that's what that's what they're doing. They're not beating up the trees. They're just trying to find those beetles. What about soil injection? We did some of that in the Cumberland Gap on a test type with um, soil injection is the same as soil drench, except for you use this kind of triangular looking tool and you shove it into the earth and then you inject a certain amount of chemical in different locations. Um, research has found that, again, uh, that type of method and the, and the chemical use has the same efficacy and efficiency rate of being metabolized by the tree as soil drench. So uh, soil drench is a lot easier sometimes around some trees. It's hard to shove that soil <laughs> injector in, whereas soil drench, you just kind of shake it in a Nalgene bottle, remove the duff and pour it at the base of the tree within 19 inches um, so those feeder roots can suck it up. So. Any other questions? I think I might have missed a comment. Sean may need to get the beetle brood rearing business. <laughs> yeah, Sean. <laughs> yeah. Can basil bark be done near water? Uh, David, that's a really great, hello. That's a really great question. Um, you know, there's, there's different types of application with basil bark. Uh, some people do it with a sprayer um, and some people suggest maybe just having a paint cup with a paintbrush and painting it on the tree. Uh, my concerns, I would not suggest doing that. My concerns with that are with the sprayer, there's always mist 
that sometimes happens if your cal if your sprayer is not calibrated correctly, so that mist can drift right and get into a water source. Um, and whenever you're putting uh, chemicals in soils and or on the bark, you have to think about the environment um, and weather conditions. If a big old rain comes and washes some of that chemical off of that bark that you just put on, um, that's not really healthy for the environment. I do know that some people use that method really close to water, uh, especially uh, some states that have a lot of sandy soils. So that's the only method they use is basal bark application. Um, but as far as efficacy and efficiency, it's the same thing as doing soil drench. It works really well. Right. Jackie, I have one final question for you um, yeah. about back again about biocontrol. Um, sure. And this is kind of a well, we'll see um, as far as movement of the beetles. Um, have has there been much work done to see, you know, are these beetles staying where they are? Are they spreading into the areas where they're released? Um, where are they found after they're released? Yeah, that's a really good question. And there are some researchers out there who are going about trying to, um, and I, excuse my vocabulary, whack for beetles within a two mile to three mile radius of their release spot. And there have been some recoveries um, made in locations that beetles were never released before. And so that is good news for us in that it means that the populations are increasing and moving to find food, to find the HWA. Um, so that's that's really good news. Um, I do want to put a caveat to that, um, which is because of the life cycle of the HWA and the life cycle of the biocontrol, it the Laracobius beetles, which is mostly what we're rearing now here in the States, they attack a certain part of the life cycle, um, a certain period of time of HWA, and they predate during that time. However, there is a second egg laying stage of HWA that the Laracobius don't attack. And so that's why we are looking into the silver fly, Leucotraxis. And the reason why is because Leucotraxis really predates all the time. And so if they could hit that late stage that's in late spring, early summer, so May, June, um, if, if Leucotraxis, the silver flies can hit HWA during that time, then we have a good one, two punch, so to say. So we can hopefully, you know, whack out HWA with that biocontrol management of those two, three, four um, biocontrols. So. Looked at the cost effectiveness of three different methods. Um, uh, I'm guessing you're talking about basal bark, tree injection, and soil drench. And yes, Stephen, the most cost effective for us, for our program, um, and for most people, is going to be the soil drench method and or the basal bark spray. Um, there are other combinations of uh, formulations of chemical. Another one is called uh, Cortec tablets. They're little tiny Cortec powdery compressed balls that you can stick in the soil. Um, we used to take a piece of rebar and a mallet and make a hole and stick the pellets down into the soil. Uh, but each one of those pellets is about 50 cents. And for a tree that's maybe 14 dBH, correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, you probably need around 28 of those pellets. So it's not as cost effective as soil drench, whereas soil drench, you have one package of water soluble package that's probably about between eight and 10, $12 a pack a little water soluble packet and you have 48 ounces or 34 ounces of chemical and if you have that same tree the 40 the 14 dbh tree you just need 10 ounces of that chemical so the the water soluble packets formulation goes a lot longer than a lot of the other um, methods Well, great. Well, I appreciate you guys. If you have any questions, uh, you can contact me um, 
through uh, going to the website, Tennessee Division of Forestry, and you could probably even just Google search me, I come up, um, and uh, you could probably just type in Hemlock Jackie, and you'll be able to find my contact information. So, uh, and also reach out to Hannah or any of my cohorts here, uh, some of the people who are presenting today, I talk to on a regular basis, so it was very nice um, presenting for you guys. Thank you, Hannah, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Jackie, for presenting. Yeah, you're very welcome. Well, I know Jackie needs to actually hit off because along with being the HWA strike team coordinator, she's our prescribed fire strike team coordinator and she has to go get a burn done. So um, I appreciate you taking the time this morning, Jackie, to talk real fast before you have to go out and hit the field. Um, and I appreciate, uh, again, all the information you provided on HWA. Um, we are a little ahead of schedule because I know Jackie was was ready to go. Um, if uh, Dr. Um, Bill Kleeman or Dr. Uh, Janina Habziabdik, if you all want to go ahead and get started, we can, or we could also take um, about a, a nine minute break. What say you, Bill? <laughs> I think that if Janita's here, we're probably ready to roll. All right, that sounds good. Um, yeah, I <laughs> will I will go ahead and turn it over to you all. You all can introduce yourself and what you'll be sharing about uh, and what you do there at, at UT. So, well, can you hear me? That's the first question. OK, so I'll let Bill introduce himself while I'm figuring out sharing on Teams. <laughs> <laughs> so. so I'm Bill Klingerman. I'm a professor in the plant sciences department at the University of Tennessee and uh, across time, my program has involved IPM and nursery and landscape plant material. And with the advent of thousand cankers disease and the walnut twig beetle, it switched a little bit at that point to uh, trees that are in our forest systems, urban forests in particular, that are under threat from pests. And then I've worked extensively with Janita, Dr. Haji Abdich, across the last, oh, decade and a half uh, with all sorts of interactions with fungal plant pathogens. And so that's what we'll be presenting to you today. And um, I, like Jackie, you can Google me uh, at UT, uh, Klingeman, K-L-I-N-G-E-M-A-N at uh, UT in plant sciences. And I'm Janita Hajabdi Jagiri. I am um Associate Professor at the University of Tennessee, Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, and I focus on forest pathology. Um, everything from molecular detection to uh, population genetics, uh, and I've been working extensively with uh, walnut and thousand canker disease, and more recently we um, started working with oaks, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, quick question, uh, can you see um, with no issues uh, my presentation? You're looking good. Okay. So um, Bill and I will be um, giving you guys an update on um, the current research in the lab and what we've done. Um, and thousand canker disease has been uh, bread and butter of our programs. Um, and we've done everything from um, basic biology uh, when the TCD was discovered in Tennessee uh, in 2010 um, to um, Marker development, population genetics, uh, diversity of um, other uh, fungal uh, species in walnut trees, um, and um, why we are seeing differences between east and west, um, and everything um, into the a little bit more heavy genomics, uh, microbiome a little bit more recently, and uh, comparative genomics. Uh, if you're not familiar with the uh, thousand canker disease, uh, it's basically um, all uh, juglans or walnut species are susceptible. Uh, it's a complex disease because it involves insect uh, vector, it involves the fungal pathogen, and it involves multiple hosts. So what is really interesting about this disease is it appeared roughly uh, in 2000s um, in the Western United States where black walnuts are planted but not native. And it completely decimated walnut trees in that area. Um, um, in Boulder, Colorado, for instance, 60% of walnut trees are completely gone. Um, and the reason we value that is because walnut is economically very important and it's one of the native trees. 
and current standing value of walnuts uh, in the United States is over $569 billion. Um, so what's really interesting, let me see if I can uh, use the laser here. Um, so uh, it's a, a pathogen, it, the detection is a little bit tricky um, because uh, oftentimes you do not even know the disease is there uh, until you see wilting and yellowing of the upper canopy. Uh, and then you have to peel the bark and look for these cankers. Uh, these cankers can oftentimes coalesce, create larger necrotic areas. They're in the phloem area, so you have to peel the bark uh, to find them. Uh, and then under the microscope, uh, the pathogen called Geosmithia morbida creates these, um, I would say, pill-shaped like um, uh, conidia. Um, they are very distinct, but they can be similar to other Geosmithia species, which makes this detection a little bit more complicated. Another problem is these beetles are very, very tiny. They're less than two millimeters. And this is where Bill and my collaboration comes in together. Bill is on entomology side of the equation here, and I'm on plant pathology side. Um, so the beetles create these tunnels. Um, they spread the, the white um, mycelium um, across uh, the tree um, and then create these large necrotic areas, which eventually clog the tree, uh, creating almost drought-like uh, symptoms. And within three to five years, very, very rapidly, the tree dies. Um, so why do we care about this beyond uh, the fact that this is economically important tree? Uh, this is one of the native, uh, we have several native species in the US, uh, but also this is a global concern because jugons, all jugon species are susceptible. Uh, and then um, in 2013, this disease has spread to Italy. And we just found out actually uh, this year that they found this disease in France as well. So this is the current distribution of thousand canker disease. Um, so just briefly, this shaded green area is the native distribution of black walnut. Uh, this is um, the positive states um, in the Western United States where the disease originated. And then in 2010, this was the first um, discovery of TCD uh, in the Eastern United States. Since then, this disease has spread uh, pretty rapidly, uh, but we found some really interesting things uh, as we moved along. So several things that we noticed immediately is um, that uh, thousand canker disease severity in introduced area, which is the Western United States, could be very, very different from the Eastern um, counterparts. So, oh, somebody's not seeing the slides advancing. I had that issue before and I had to change my view of people versus gallery versus focus on screen. So that may help with your problem. Okay, what did you do exactly, Bill? Sorry. I was just tabbing between the different uh, view options and then my screen was advancing. So let us know if that has fixed your problem. Otherwise, Hannah may have guidance for us. I was going to say okay. I can see your slides advancing. So so I would do what uh, Dr. Klingman mentioned and, and change the view that you're seeing, Bill. We'll see if that works. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, a typical symptoms is something uh, like this here. You would have this upper uh, dieback um, canopy. Um, and part of the problem with that diagnostic is almost everything else looks like that. <laughs> any other drought, any other um, discoloration can cause similar symptoms. So it's not very good diagnostic um, uh, uh, symptom. Uh, and in severe cases, this is Arizona walnut, uh, one of the least susceptible species on the spectrum of um, uh, walnut uh, species, it's completely decimated uh, and basically dead. And this is one of the wild trees that we collected. Uh, and this is uh, within a few years, um, the leaves are completely gone uh, and the tree, this is on campus of uh, Colorado State University. Um, interestingly, in the Eastern part of the country where uh, the drought, which we found years later, is a very big driving factor for the pathogen and the amount of beetles or the beetle pressure is very important as well. Um, so this particular branch that you see with the yellow arrow here uh, is the beginning of the symptoms and the tree looked pretty devastating in 2010. And four years later, we had a complete recovery. Uh, we do not know the integrity of that particular tree per se, but on the other hand, uh, in similar area, this is another tree that was infested and it's completely dead. 
So we noticed uh, these two different outcomes in the eastern part of the country. Uh, so we know that there is some kind of um, uh, genetic makeup of the native trees in the native range. Uh, and what we wanted to do is to have a little bit better idea on um, why this is happening and how can we quickly uh, identify and detect the presence of the disease. Because by the time we peel the bark and see the upper canopy flagging and dieback, it's oftentimes too late. Uh, so we developed these molecular markers for both beetle and the pathogen. Uh, and the beauty of these is they're species specific. So even though if we have environmental DNA, meaning that uh, we isolate DNA from the infested wood, uh, that DNA can contain everything from the host walnut DNA to other insect species to other fungi. Because we have these species specific markers, only the pathogen of interest in our case, geosmithia, is going to be amplifying on our gel. So that is the beauty of that system. So, um, and why did we want to do that? Um, because traditional uh, detection is uh, very time consuming, laborious. And we also notice the difference between Eastern and Western isolates and obtaining those isolates in the East is much more complicated uh, because we do not have a specific medium. We do not have um, a methodology to speed this up. And it's a very, very slow growing pathogen. So it's quickly outcompeted with everything else that grows inside of the walnut tree. Um, so uh, obtaining pure culture is, is uh, time consuming, expensive and laborious. Um, so this work was completed by one of my master's uh, students as well as the postdoc Romina Gazis and uh, Amel Oren. And uh, what we did is basically when we received a sample, uh, we peeled the bark um, and we uh, placed the uh, bark chips uh, in what we call the moist chamber uh, so we can have a sporulation of the pathogen. Uh, and after three to five days, hopefully, uh, this is what we get in the best case scenario. Um, and after we obtain one of these uh, conidiophores, which are the structures that bury uh, conidia or the spores of the fungus, uh, we do something um, uh, that is not very common for fungi, but we do almost like a bacterial streaking. Uh, and the reason for that is simply to get rid of any other uh, potential contaminants so we can obtain uh, this pure culture. Um, oftentimes, this process can take several weeks uh, to obtain pure culture, which can be too late um, if we are trying to do any regulatory um, or controlling um, um, quarantine um, related issues. Uh, reality is this is what we often get. <laughs> so um, it's very messy work. It's really hard to obtain pure cultures. As I said, uh, they quickly outcompeted with everything else. Uh, and from hundreds of uh, plates, um, we obtain uh, several few cultures, um, but it can be um, time consuming. So uh, another complication with that for untrained person, this can be also really complicated because morphology uh, is very plastic. Um, so all of these on top are actually pure confirmed uh, geosmithia morbida, but in culture, they look slightly different. So if you're untrained, uh, how geosmithia can look in culture, this and this are two very different cultures. Uh, and also on different media, this is on PDA and this is on MEA, uh, they can also have a different morphologies as well. So um, to avoid all of this confusion, we wanted to create molecular detection, but also uh, to make things more complicated, uh, we uh, also wanted to see why we're seeing these differences between East and West. Uh, and uh, the, the solution is very, very interesting. Uh, in Tennessee trees, uh, Tennessee walnut trees, um, we found a lot of uh, trichoderma species, which we did not find uh, on X axis. Uh, we have basically uh, OTUs, which are uh, operational um, taxonomic units. Uh, they show the abundance of a particular um, individual. And we found a lot of trichoderma which are associated with native trees and usually uh, could be used as a biological control. Um, and in uh, Western samples or California samples, we found uh, almost no presence of uh, trichoderma. Uh, now we are exploring some of those options for biological control. So, so we can uh, basically use uh, commercially available strains as well as strains that we discovered uh, to potentially control this disease. Um, and this is how it's uh, originally done. We just uh, dual plate assay is basically when you place on a single plate uh, one geosmithia isolate and on the other side of the plate you 
basically um, place a trichoderma isolate. And if the reaction is compatible, this trichoderma is going to basically grow on top of this um, uh, geosmithia, uh, thus not allowing uh, this particular strain to um, uh, develop uh, any further and therefore uh, being used as a biological control. Uh, part of this is because we did not have any commercially available products until 2018. So Phosphajet was the first commercial product uh, that was used for um, uh, thousand canker disease. And we've been doing some experiments in the greenhouse and one of my uh, PhD students, um, uh, Aaron Onofrak has been working on that for the past few years. Um, so this is basically some of the work that we've been doing during pandemic, uh, trying to inoculate the trees with geosmithia uh, and then treat them with uh, both chemical and biological control uh, and see uh, how the tree responds uh, to uh, these different pressures. So in order to speed up the process of detection of the pathogen, um, we did um, something called molecular detection uh, or diagnostic. And this was ML's master's project. Um, and the process was very simple, but we would drill uh, basically uh, through the uh, a canker, obtain this wood shaving, uh, isolate DNA from the wood shaving. And you also have to remember there's a lot of randomness uh, or environmental um, uh, contaminants in this particular sample. But because we have those species specific uh, microsatellites or markers, we were able to isolate DNA, and if the sample contained even traces of uh, geosmithia morbida, we were able to confirm uh, the presence of the pathogen. And this is just to kind of summarize a little bit of um, these differences that we were seeing uh, in the Western versus Eastern isolates. Uh, and uh, there is a very high incidence of walnut twig beetle uh, or the vector uh, in Western isolates versus Eastern isolates. Um, there was also much higher colonization of these, um, the, the fungus uh, in the West versus East. Um, also in the East, we found alternative vectors, uh, which is another interesting, uh, maybe Bill can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we were able to use our microsatellites to confirm um, basically crushing these different uh, insects and confirming the presence of um, the fungus on those. So, um, this is the visualization using Kayaxel uh, electrophoresis, which is uh, a version of basically a molecular um, uh, uh, electronic uh, gel. Uh, this is a piece of equipment that's relatively expensive, um, but um, it is with high accuracy can uh, show the peak presence of the geosmithia or uh, the beetle. Uh, and then this is how we would confirm uh, that the, the given uh, wood shaving um, has either presence of uh, uh, pathogen or the vector of thousand canker disease. What is really important about this is that we reduce from several weeks to eight to 10 hours uh, confirmation of the presence of one or the other, meaning pathogen or the beetle. Um, so this was uh, published in PLOS One uh, and in California samples in orchard that uh, we knew most of the trees were affected and infected our detection rate using this particular method was 85%. And in Tennessee, because we sampled across uh, 40 different trees in the county that was not necessarily every single tree was confirmed, uh, it was just the county that was infested, uh, we had around 42.5%. And we used Missouri uh, as a, a basically control, which is a disease-free uh, region, and we tested 40 trees there, and all 40 trees were negative. Um, so we wanted to simplify that methodology, and uh, uh, this is what uh, Bill's student, uh, Tammy Stackhouse, uh, was working on. And Bill, would you like to take over from here, or? Uh, keep rolling. You've got it. You asked sure. about other insect vectors of mm -hmm. thousand cankers disease, and in Indiana and Tennessee, Stenomimus pallidus is a very small, it's about the size of a comma, uh, pale pale weevil that was found to be associated with the bark, uh, with gen uh, Geosmithium morbida, and also some of the ambrosia beetles like uh, Xylobarina uh, saxasenii, that's a tongue twister, and Xylosandrus crassiusculus and germanus on occasion would be found also associating with walnut and having the, uh, the DNA 
either on or within their body. Ambrosia beetles have a structure that uh, preserves and, and holds fungi so that they can colonize uh, trees. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but I'll let you keep running with Tammy's presentation. So what we wanted to do is now that we knew that the molecular detection can be reduced to eight, 10 hours, uh, we have a system. We wanted to simplify uh, the protocol even further. So any disease clinic in the country, uh, which our disease clinic is located in uh, Nashville, uh, can run the protocol using a simple PCR machine, not necessarily qPCR, which is a gold standard for confirmation. Uh, so Tammy had several different methods. So she wanted to take ML's approach uh, for molecular detection, the work that we published in PLOS One, and use the conventional gel, uh, which is the least expensive method, uh, to basically uh, try to confirm the presence of the pathogen. Uh, we were not as successful with the beetle uh, for these methodologies, and there were a few reasons for that. Um, but the pathogen worked pretty well, and we also wanted to even further simplify this and try to use the uh, basically blue light and the blocking glasses uh, to simply uh, visualize almost uh, in similar to pregnancy tests, just the color change uh, of presence or absence uh, of the pathogen. So uh, the presence would be green fluorescence uh, and red color indicated on the left would be absence of the pathogen. Uh, and of course, we had to confirm everything using the qPCR. Uh, which has a very low detection rate, uh, and uh, that is something that we can confirm. Uh, again, this is a gold standard for molecular detection, but very expensive piece of equipment. So we just wanted to make sure that these methodologies do work indeed, and we can do the confirmation uh, using a variety of methods. So we uh, basically wanted to use the TACMAN probe, uh, which is uh, basically method and visualization of fluorescent uh, excitation and uh, emission using this uh, fluorescent protein flashlight. Um, and we use the same approach for thousand canker disease. And we also proved that this methodology can work with any other species specific primers. So when we uh, tested this for different fungi, for different bacteria, uh, we did uh, basically um, a concept uh, methodology uh, for some other species. Uh, we realized we could use this for oak wilt and laurel wilt, which we will be talking about that as well. Um, so for laurel wilt, which is a relatively new disease for us, um, it's um, much easier to detect uh, compared to thousand canker disease, uh, but early detection and asymptomatic trees is what we're really interested in. Um, so for us, um, basically sassafras and spice bush are the two species that are affected. Uh, laurel wilt is another complex disease um, that is um, mainly affecting um, uh, avocados, uh, a lot of plants in the Laraceae family. Uh, and uh, this is a very, very simplistic um, uh, wilt disease mechanism. Uh, but basically, this, the, the, the system uh, basically goes um, into the overdrive uh, blocks using tylosis, uh, the, the, the transportation of water uh, and nutrients and uh, induces uh, basically wilting of the tree. So uh, it is um, also transmitted um, by the vector uh, and Bill will be talking about that particular vector. Uh, this pathogen is a little bit easier to work with uh, for the plating because there is a media that we can use. Uh, but recently the pathogen was um, renamed from Brachiella uh, lauricola to uh, Harringtonia lauricola. Uh, and it's basically uh, vectored by the red, uh, red bay ambrosia beetle. Uh, pathogen does produce certain toxins, and then it creates this hypersensitive response uh, that is uh, responsible for uh, blocking the xylem and eventually um, resulting in similar uh, fashion like thousand canker disease, uh, looking like a drought stress. So why do we care about this? Uh, because uh, this is the projection for laurel wilt was not to be in Tennessee uh, in uh, 2019 or 2020. Uh, and it has spread actually to uh, Kentucky as well. But this is the native range of uh, spice bush and sassafras. Uh, and the projections for this is that uh, it would reach Texas by 2045. But because of the climate change and the severe uh, drought conditions, we're seeing some of the pathogens from the south moving further north, uh, including 
Tennessee. Um, so this is how the pathogen looks like uh, after peeling the bark, uh, the streaking and discoloration uh, of the vascular um, uh, system is pretty obvious. Uh, and um, we uh, develop very similar system to molecular detection uh, that we developed for TCD. So uh, the PhD student in my lab, uh, Mahir Oni, uh, the one who is actually uh, here, uh, has been working on uh, this particular project. And it's pretty neat because what she's done is basically use the conventional gel method uh, from the previous that we knew that it worked. Uh, and then she developed uh, uh, basically dilution of the DNA um, from, um, first she did the pure DNA and then she did environmental DNA basically contaminated uh, with everything else. Uh, and she was able to, uh, using the Kyxel system here, uh, to go as low as uh, 0.32 picogram, which is very, very low amount of DNA. Uh, and similar amounts, uh, 1.6, a little bit more than that, uh, was what we were able to get with a conventional gel. Uh, so this is the least expensive part. Uh, it is very easy to uh, run this in any basic molecular lab. Uh, and this way, diagnostic clinics across the country uh, would hopefully be able to um, run the sample and confirm, even in asymptomatic trees, uh, that the uh, pathogen uh, is either present or absent. Uh, and of course, uh, we used um, uh, the Q qPCR to confirm these findings, and the lowest detection rate with qPCR was 1.6 uh, picograms, uh, which was very nice. And then from here, I will um, let Bill take over. Sure, and because I don't have control, I'll let you go ahead and advance the slides as we have them. Some things to point out, and if you've had the pleasure of traveling to the Gulf States or Florida, bay trees are uh, in huge decline throughout that area, and that's uh, a pretty remarkable thing, how the ecosystem around bay has been impacted. So you have forest areas that are uh, almost devoid of bay trees in that area. And that's where there is also proximal to those areas where our avocado in the U.S. come from. And Romina Gazis in Florida is looking at alternative vectors in the avocado system. And something to point about uh, avocado and bay, bay in particular and sassafras, when you cut that tree, and the image of, of Maher, she was smelling the bark. It's a very strong fragrance. And part of what is in the fragrance of host trees in the Loraceae that the uh, non-native uh, Xyloborus glabratus are attracted to is a chemical constituent called alpha-copaine. And it is a product that you can put out as a lure to attract beetles into a, a site so that you can see whether they are active in the area. And from that, we're able to look and see if there are fungi associated with those beetles that are our target DNA from uh, Harringtonia lauricula. Uh, Xyloborus glabratus utilizes uh, uh, Harringtonia lauricula as its preferred food resource, and it's very effective at vectoring the disease from one tree to another. Once it's established in that area, the uh, the pathogen has a potential to root graft and spread tree to tree in that environment and as well without the beetle. But we have seen in Florida that Xylosandrus crassiusculus and some other beetles that we have in much fewer numbers in East Tennessee uh, also are potential candidate vectors and carry uh, the pathogen among and between uh, avocado trees. So we looked in addition to the uh, alpha copaine, we put out ethanol lures in our East Tennessee Hamlin County site, and we're screening some of the other beetles that we uh, suspected may be potentially interacting with affected uh, sassafras and found that Xylosandrus crassiusculus and Dryoxalon onaharensis uh, are, in fact, uh, carrying the pathogen. We find them as a body wash and also on macerated beetle samples. So we do a wash. We test just what is washed off the beetle. <clears throat> so very fine amounts, small amounts of DNA, and then macerate the beetle to see if there is perhaps um, the fungus interacting inside the beetle. Either as a digestive component in the digestive tract or within mycangia. 
Something that surprised me was the number of Stenocellus brevis bark beetles uh, that we were encountering in the traps that had the alpha copaine lures. And so we were curious to know if those were interacting with sassafras in that East Tennessee site. And we did find, <coughs> excuse me, the pathogen on both the wash and in macerated samples of the bodies of those. And we're digging a little deeper to see how many of the beetles uh, may actively be carrying that. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we have some of the seasonal activity of these beetles. Do we advance one? Uh, you can see that the beetles are active. Stenocellus brevis for us in East Tennessee was present early in the season, May and June into uh, early July, and the numbers dropped off precipitously after that. <clears throat> and Crassiusculus is, I should say that Stenocellus brevis, I believe, is native, but the others are all non-native uh, beetles in our area. So Xyloborinus, uh, Xyloborus Crassiusculus has uh, pretty high population peaks. And one of the concerns that has been expressed about Florida is the diversity of the mycangial symbionts. We don't want to see some of these other non-native beetles taking on uh, Harringtonia loricola as a, an, a symbiont that they can then spread to other uh, loraceae that includes uh, sweet, uh, spice bush also. Okay, next slide. I'll let you take it from here and then I'll pick back up. So in the same capacity, we are working on uh, oak wilt. And uh, according to maps from the 70s and 80s, oak wilt is present in the US uh, in Tennessee. Um, but we were unable to find records of that um, from the institutional knowledge, from the Forest Service, from uh, state forest foresters. Um, nobody could confirm uh, where those sites were located um, per se. Uh, so we started noticing some symptoms of a uh, disease that looks like oak wilt uh, because Meher also is working on molecular detection of laurel wilt, but also molecular detection of oak wilt uh, as well as virulence and transcriptomics uh, because we do not know much about that. This is a much bigger problem uh, Northeast um, Michigan area. Um, and uh, so what we were trying to do with that is uh, we found a tree uh, in Knox County uh, that had very similar symptoms. And this is, um, there are several other diseases that are similar to oak wilt um, that display similar uh, yellowing of the leaves and then browning eventually. Um, so um, we found actually that we have um, the Diplodia corticola um, in, uh, Knox County right now, and we would like to dig a little bit deeper to see how widely spread this is in Tennessee. Uh, we found this uh, particular disease on uh, pin oak. Uh, we found this on overcup oak, on uh, sawtooth oak, um, and then uh, I do believe both uh, red and white oak uh, were completed a little bit earlier uh, as susceptible hosts. So this is a little bit troubling. And we believe this is a little bit bigger uh, problem than initially thought. Uh, but part of the problem is this is uh, heavily mixed with uh, other similar looking like diseases. Back to you, Bill. OK, uh, yes. So bacterial wilt is a, an oak pathogen that's very similar in appearance. And this was one of our thoughts was that these earlier reports of oak wilt in Tennessee may have been confused. And a number of folk who had uh, heard of the reports uh, had not been able to recover the pathogen. And so knowing how much of a concern that uh, oak wilt is in Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, into Canada, um, Michigan, New York, uh, east, northeastern U.S., also in Texas, uh, a diagnostic tool would be tremendously helpful. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of that. So you can see symptoms. There are a number of beetles that are, we can go ahead to that next slide. Um, obviously having a, a molecular detection tool like we've seen for thousand cankers disease and for uh, laurel wilt would be very helpful for this one. Number of different beetles that are active vectors and spreading the pathogen, the very uh, attractive looking griscoclylus 
fasciatus is an attractive beetle. Uh, these are about uh, three to four millimeters long, black with that yellow barring. There's some other Gliscrochylus that we see pretty widespread throughout the eastern U.S. Carpophilus sei uh, with the red shouldered epaulets, uh, down below Coleopterus truncatus, so those three different uh, genera, and there are multiple Carpophilus and Coleopterus that associate with uh, the fungal mats that are under the bark of trees. And the image you see on your far left with the square boxes are showing from Texas at a very um, hot, it's a very hot spot uh, where uh, there live oak, red oak, a number of other oaks are affected uh, in Texas. And at this particular spot, the red oak have heavy uh, infestation and, and uh, pathogen uh, presence of uh, Brettsiella. And these beetles that you can see, they're not, it's not a good close up image of them, but they don't quite match. You can see some of the pale banding on the elytra and have received samples back from our Texas cooperators, Damian Gomez and Aaron Davis there. And they look different from what we see in the Eastern US. And so we've been uh, having those looked at. It turns out that even though there are some differences in morphology of the beetles, uh, they're all grouped together in Carpophilus um, mutilatus, which is one that we can find in Tennessee, but it's nowhere near as prevalent at that site uh, over the course of time. I think we've seen on some collection dates across uh, a period of time, several hundred coming into our traps at one time. Uh, there are pheromone traps that are available. These are sexual cues that Coleopterus and Carpophilus are attracted to. We also bait the lures, and if we go to the next slide, I think we have an image of the traps that we're using. The chemistry is impregnated on those rubber septa in gray, pinned inside a wind orienting trap, which is beside that. You can see how that is suspended in that Texas habitat. The wind blows through, and the beetles are attracted into the upwind chamber at the far end underneath the vein that's orienting. And we use these traps instead of the funnel traps that you see on the right side, because we were hoping to get dry samples that we could uh, not collect into a preservative and that we could then discreetly tell which individuals of which species might be associating with the fungus and the trees. And we have Texas cooperators. We also worked with folks in New York to obtain some of their samples. Uh, and we've tested in Tennessee as well. Our next slide. Uh, well, I'll, I'll stop talking about that real briefly, other than to say that we are finding that there are several other Carpophilus and Coleopterus uh, present in Texas, and we did not find yet the DNA of um, Brettsiella on the New York samples. Uh, that could be just because of the relatively few individuals we were able to capture and test up there, and we're working on uh, testing optimization. Uh, and in Texas, we have detected um, the pathogen on the beetles that we've collected. We're going through, I think we have now 11 different species of sap beetle that interact in that habitat, and we're going to be screening them both for uh, which species are interacting and uh, when during the season that the pathogen can be detected on the specimens. One thing that was of interest, uh, Coleopterus truncatus and Carpophilus sei, which are our culprits most often in the eastern U.S., uh, we found those in very low numbers in Texas. What we're finding there are these Carpophilus mutilatus beetles. So on this side, we're switching gears a little bit entirely. How are we doing for time? I think I have six minutes. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I'll just briefly then talk about Axel Gonzalez's work, who is working with flat-headed borers. Again, oaks, maples, dogwoods, all susceptible to uh, the flat-headed borer. And you are inevitably familiar with the damage. You see these on maple trunks low on the tree in parkland trees uh, where you have maples that are planted in public areas. You'll see uh, scarring and damage at the base of the tree that is often due to the beetle's response to stress volatiles uh, put out 
uh, and the beetle then the adult comes and lays eggs. If we go to the next slide, uh, there is a complex of 12 different beetle species within the uh, Chrysobothrus femorata group that all look very similar. And Axel is working on genetic detection to tell these apart. If we go to the next slide. Uh, the damage that you see under crop landscape it shows you what you'd see in the la uh, landscape on juvenile trees, especially thin bark trees, where that larva has fed extensively beneath the bark. You can see the flat-headed larva uh, there beside the egg. And this is a concern in nursery operations too. The beetles are opportunists, taking care of, uh, taking advantage of stress, volatiles, and other factors like flooding to uh, find suitable host plants that includes dogwood, walnut. Uh, in the west coast US, hazelnut and blueberry in Florida all have been attacked by members of the Chrysobothrus femorata species group. Part of what Axel will be doing is to focus in on which species in which crop systems are giving the greatest uh, level of damage so that we can better time pesticide controls to screen pesticides across these different species to figure out which may be more effective. There may be some of the species that are resistant. And we find in East Tennessee uh, about seven of the 12 fairly regularly in oak forest habitats. Probably because of time, I should pause there and allow our folks to ask some questions of us. Gonna go quickly here, um, and then if anybody has any questions, it's what happens when you have two PhDs tag teaming in presentation. <laughs> we get excited about our stuff. Anything from the floor? I'll open up the chat to see if there's anything coming in. I guess while I, we're waiting, I can, Janita, if you'll back up three or four slides to all the genitalia, this is the slide that makes your parents proud for what it is that you do. The way to discriminate these beetles is under a microscope after pulling out the male genitalia there on the left or looking at the female uh, pygidium and carinal structures. And you have to spend time orienting the slide in different directions to actually see uh, which it is. And then the characteristics are variable uh, within individuals, especially when you look across the state. So if we can find some DNA uh, evidence, we might be able to do some population genetics on these. David Merker asks, is there a homeowner remedy for laurel wilt? Uh, unfortunately, at this point, our best remedy for laurel wilt is a chainsaw and removing the affected plant material. I saw that John Henderson was on uh, and he was gracious enough to host us uh, at that East Tennessee site in Hamblin County. A number of those part uh, sassafras that were heavily infected have been removed. Um, I was there, I think, earlier this uh, late fall, early spring, and a lot of the trees that would have been hosting and supporting uh, populations of these beetles have been removed. Uh, and so that's kind of our concern is we want to, uh, we don't have a good way to know where the beetles are coming from and they're very strong uh, flyers. So that control can be challenging if they're coming from a distance farther away. Of course, that is one of the more expensive options. And so um, we don't have the research yet to know if trichoderma can be playing a competitive role in a laurel wilt system as well as it seems to be doing in East Coast or Eastern US walnut trees. Laurel, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, trichoderma, a number of different trichoderma species seem to be interacting with our trees in Tennessee. And to end on a high note, I would say that uh, in East Tennessee, we have seen some significant recovery of walnut trees that had had uh, infection by thousand cankers disease. The pathogen is quite probably still present. Uh, the beetle population has diminished, 
uh, although we're finding other pop up outbreaks in different parts of the country, including Kentucky. Uh, so John asks, questions. OK, go ahead. Who do we report to if we think we found something that looks like oak wilt in the field? We would love to know that. Uh, the Haji Abdich lab would love to have samples for that so that we can try and detect that pathogen. Uh, we have permits to receive material from you from across the state. Uh, and so I would encourage you to reach out to her by email. Sean Hendrickson asks, is there hope for replanting this species and making it? And then it got truncated. I think perhaps we're talking about sassafras as a tree or I'm not sure about oaks. One of the reasons we may not be finding um, oak wilt in Tennessee could be because uh, the red oaks, when they collapse and decline, uh, it, it pretty much kills out the stands of adjacent red oaks at that location. Uh, and there would be a longer period of time before uh, the trees could regrow in that habitat. A hope for replanting sassafras. I certainly hope so. It is uh, a fantastic tree. I will say at that East Tennessee site, we have seen that juvenile sassafras under areas where adult uh, mature sassafras have been removed seem to be thriving. So we'll keep our eyes out on that. If you remove the active um, gallery support trees, one would hope that we would reduce the population of this non-native Xyloborus glabratus beetle. Uh, and so uh, stay tuned, we hope so. Um, I think we're, because we're a little running a little short on time, um, any additional questions, y'all feel free to answer in the chat. Um, I will but do I'm so I'm going to go now. ahead and get Jennifer um, started if she's, I know she's on, um, but Jennifer, if you want to go ahead and work towards getting your slides up and everything like that. Thank you all both for sharing. That's a lot of cool information <laughs> that you shared. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> all right, I'll go ahead and introduce Jennifer while she's getting her slides ready. Um, uh, Jennifer Smith works with the uh, Nashville um, Metro uh, Water Services and is the coordinator for Ma Metro Tree Advisory Committee um, here in Nashville. Um, she's going to be sharing about emerald ash borer um, and about, you know, identifying it, what, what we've done um, in our urban and community forests to um, address the issue um, and specifically from her perspective um, as a horticulturalist um, here in Nashville. Um, she's got a lot of good insight um, on EAB management from, from an urban and community force perspective. And Jennifer, How, if you're having any issue yes, sharing your slides. I'm just, um, I am just having a problem because of the, when we tested this, the security and privacy screen recording, since it's being recorded, I have to give extra permission apparently. Okay. Do you know where that is? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm so sorry about this. We we worked on this. If you would like, I can also pull up your PowerPoint <clears throat> and I right. can present and you can just tell me when you want me to advance. That would be awesome. Thank you. Okay. I will go ahead and work on that. Hello, everyone. And while we're doing this, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about something that's a big issue in our country. Um, so can you all see the screen? I guess I can. So um, um, just a little bit about me, too. Um, I was the state director of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council for many years, working across the state with with cities and I'm so glad to to also be here in Metro Nashville and I had been talking about the emerald ash borer so much that um, can change the slide that um, on my birthday the staff I work with got these cookies put together to make um, the emerald ash borer tree because they heard me talk about it nonstop for so long. And I was getting calls from people all over and 
I realized that we needed to put together a presentation for our neighbors, the average citizen to understand the emerald ash borer um, epidemic in Nashville. One of the co-workers that I reached out to in Ohio who had already been through this said, Jennifer, this will be the biggest issue you will work on in your professional career. And he was certainly right. We estimate in Nashville, there's about 1.6 million ash trees. Hannah. So um, it is attacking all native species, in North America ash trees, unless they are treated, all of them will die. That's a big issue. They, um, we believe that the, the boars came to um, the United States in, as packing material. They used ashwood with the, um, the larvae inside and the ground zero was in Michigan. I remember specifically the day in 2010 when it was first found confirmed at a, a truck stop outside of Knoxville, Knox County, probably because someone was moving firewood and left it there. And then of course the day in 2014 that it was noted in Nashville um, in the Old Hickory area. So what does it do? Well, at first the, the adult female lays its egg on the bark, the outside bark of the ash tree. Now it can lay a lot of eggs, 40 to 70 eggs per, per bore. So that's a lot. Once they hatch, they go in and they're wanting that live tissue just under the bark. That's where they want to live for a year or two as they get bigger, the larvae. And then once they, um, they start to change, they pupate into an adult, they exit um, with this perfect D-shaped exit wound. And we'll see a picture of that a little bit later. And once they exit, then they fly on to um, other trees. Now, most of the exit wounds, um, they're about the size of a, a, I don't know, point of a pencil. So they're high up in the tree and you really, it's really hard to see. Um, next. So the first question we want our citizens to ask is, do I even have an ash tree? And you'll see the leaf, leaflet shape here. And isn't that a beautiful, I just love the canopy of, of the ash trees. Um, and the beautiful diamond shaped bark of the older trees, the smooth bark of the younger trees, and then these oar shaped seed pods that you'll see. So those are just some of the clues. Next. And then perhaps one of the best clues for me is to look up and see if the branches are opposite. So you can see on the middle um, photo here, when a branch goes on one side, it goes to the opposite. And maples do that and dogwoods, but ash do that as well. And we don't want um, our citizens to be confused with the walnuts and the other, um, the box elder, the other leaflet trees as well. So we um, have that as a note for, or to note as well. Next. So once you know if you have an ash tree, and it will be also important to note if your neighbor has one, um, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but you see basically the tree is dying back. You see the larvae here in the bottom picture on the left, that larvae is eating through that tissue and making it hard or impossible for nutrients and water to get up to the top of the tree to uh, feed, it, feed it. So literally it's drying back from the top. And you can see the zero die back 30% all down to, to the 80%. But remember this 30% die back photo for, for a few minutes. And then you see below the um, D-shaped exit wounds, how small they are, but they're always perfectly shaped like a D. Next. So is my ash infested? Right now, um, here in Davidson County in Middle Tennessee, we're just waiting to see um, when the leaves come out or not, perhaps in May, to know if some of these trees that haven't um, already died um, will, will come back out. Um, we, we really have noticed more pockets of ash in certain areas in our county than th maybe throughout the whole thing, but um, they've certainly naturalized in our, our parks. and. Um, we're gonna 
be missing a lot of trees in our parks, very sad. But you can see the L-shaped tunnels under the bark and then um, the sprouts. The, the tree really has many ways to help um, heal itself or help make sure it can live. And one is since the tree senses it's, it can't get um, water and nutrients up to the leaves, it knows it needs leaves to photosynthesize and create food. So it's putting out these sprouts at the base to create leaves to photosynthesize, but that's not a long-term solution. But I think um, I really admire trees on how they um, take care of themselves. The bottom is a vertical bark split. Again, it's just basically because the bark is, is drying out. Um, the blonding or, um, or flecking by the woodpeckers. I have not seen much of this, but um, the woodpeckers just fleck off the outside bark so they can get in and get the larvae. Next. So once you determine if you have an ash tree, um, again, all native ash trees will die at some point unless they're treated. So um, in once you know your ash tree um, is infected or before you know it is infected, you need to make a management decision about how you're gonna treat your ash tree. You can um, treat it, and we'll get to that by chemicals. You can let it die or you can remove it. But let's look on the right side, how, how dangerous these trees can be. It's called the ash snap. And this is a real thing where they can um, just snap over close to the base. So think of the hazards that could cause um, in our streets, perhaps in your backyard, your neighbor's tree, hmm, it could come over into your yard. So you need to be aware of, of these, these hazards the trees make once they start to dry up and it's called the ash snap. And you see um, the middle cartoon photo, um, that's the barber chair, they call that. Um, so once it snaps, it kind of creates a barber chair. And that's why you really need to have someone who understands um, tree removal to take care of these trees. But let's um, talk about let it die. So if your ash tree is in a place where it has no targets, zero targets, a target might be a car where the children play, where people walk. If there's none of those targets, then let it die. It might snap over, that's fine. Um, because it is so dry and brittle, it won't take that, ma that many years to just biodegrade, which is fine. And in that process, that live tissue, of course, will, will shrink and die and the bores there will die with it. Remove it is another option and um, it's a good option. It's hard to think that I would have a, a healthy tree at this moment um, removed, but knowing that at some point that tree um, will get the emerald ash borer and, and die and become an issue. So um, do you remember when I noted the 30% die back? You need to get your tree, if that's your management decision is to have that tree removed, it's best to get it before it gets to 30%. Because after that time, it's too much of a hazard for a tree climber to climb in the tree and take it down as they usually do branch by branch. Um, you would all have to, at that time, be able to get a bucket truck to the tree. But let's think about if your tree is on a slope and could not get a bucket truck to it or in a enclosed fence area. So that's why you have to be proactive in making your decision on which treatment you're going to do and removing it. It's not a, it's not a bad management option to remove a healthy tree in this particular situation. Um, and also note, because this is going through the state, all of our arborists are so busy and um, you need to get in line to make sure that you can get someone out to help you. And then the other option is to treat it. Now, there's different ways to approach this and you depending on your management, um, how you need to manage it. That's important to note, but um, there's the soil drench, there is the bark spray, and then there's the chemical injection. Now, the um, trunk spray is for trees that are 12 inches and smaller, the, and you can get um, a safari or diatoferin um, product at the box stores, and 
and it's a trike spray. But again, if your tree um, is more than 11 or 12 inches in diameter, it's not going to have that great impact. Um, you remember how um, the young bark was very smooth, and once it gets older and develops, that's why it's harder to penetrate. Um, you can do the um, metacropid. That is the base, you do at the base of the trunk um, of the tree and it goes into the roots and the roots take and goes up into the tree. And then there's the injection. Now the bark spray in the soil drench, you have to do every year for the rest of the healthy life of that tree because that tree is only gonna live a certain amount anyway. But the chemical injections um, as it is now um, is every two years. And the nice thing about that is um, it gets the chemical, it injects it right into that tissue about an inch, inch and three quarters to go up into, um, right into where the leaves are, the branches, right where the bores will be at the top. That's a, a good, good option. Um, you need to make the one that fits your budget, but let's think of it. You know, having a tree removed is very expensive. The first person I had asked me about this years ago um, had 17 ash trees just in his front yard. And that's when I realized that we needed to put this type of program out um, through the Tree Advisory Committee here in Nashville um, to help our citizens make their decision on, on how they're going to address this epidemic. Um, so you have, again, the soil drench and the bark spray. And those are every year, but the um, soil drench, um, you know, it's about a 20 inch diameter. So the, the trunk um, spray is about 12 inches, 20 inches for the, the base drench. And then the more heritage, the larger trees, that's when you need to inject it right into that um, tissue, that live tissue that goes up into the tree. So those are your three uh, management options there. And it's good, um, even if you think your tree's not infested, you need to go ahead and think about it. Right now, for me, I have three ash trees. Um, I'm having mine injected every two years. Um, it's not inexpensive. Um, I have a tree that is um, with my neighbor and we are um, sharing that cost. And I am, frankly, I'm just, <laughs> delaying the decision of whether I want to take these trees down. Maybe I'm emotionally attached to them. I'm sure I am to some extent. Um, but that's a, a decision you have to make because remember taking a tree down can also cost thousands. So you, you really have to balance that in your budget. Next. So what is the owner's responsibility? So you have your tree. So we're gonna go over your neighbor's tree, a boundary tree and the right-of-way trees. So the right-of-way tree is a tree that um, is in the right-of-way by the street. Just think of it as a street tree. And those trees here in Nashville, um, we have taken an inventory of our street trees because of this epidemic. And um, we are not going to be treating our ash. We are going to take them down. In the parks, we're just going to fell them. We're just going to leave it there, leave all the trunks and the branches there to biodegrade. Um, and that's how we in Metro have decided how to, to deal with our trees. Um, we have a very active Emerald Ash Borer um, working committee that we meet four times a year to discuss all these. Um, we have Metro Legal as part of that team. So we're really being proactive in our approach and how we manage these trees. Um, we've done inventories in our parks, so um, that is very important for communities to do that. Now you may have a boundary tree. I mentioned this earlier. By state law, the boundary tree is between two properties. Now it could be um, that it's 50-50 and this is where the trunk is, or it could be 20-80 or some sort of combination. And that in any kind of decision for the health and management of that tree, both property owners are supposed to be involved. And um, I don't think a lot of people know that. I get a lot of calls from people um, sad that a neighbor took down the tree that's on their property. So um, that is um, both property owners are supposed to make management decisions. 
Um, and, um, and then again, your neighbor's tree, it's very important to communicate with them about the seriousness of this epidemic. If you feel that they have an ash tree and that it could, um, you, your property, your cars, your children's play area could be a target for that. So you have to address that um, directly with them. Okay, Hannah. So just as a um, FYI, just um, here in Nashville, in certain areas of the city, we have a, a chipper service that comes through and picks up stuff, um, brush, debris. And most chipper services cut, um, chip the everything to about a one inch square. And that one inch square um, really prevents the emerald ash borer from, from living because there's just not enough live tissue. So then, then that's a good thing because then they're bringing it across town um, to dump at, at a place. And so again, those ash borers will die because there's just not enough live tissue there. Um, and uh, note that trees.nashville.gov um, website. This, um, if you can see, is our brochure. And most of what I'm covering today is in this brochure and you can download it from that site um, there. But um, yeah, just um, note that if you even hire somebody and they chip it up, then it's, it's grounded to a point where there's not enough tissue for each board to live through. Next. So one of the things we also realize is that many of our citizens here in Nashville have never asked uh, hired an arborist. So we wanted to add some tips um, and important things. Ask for proof of liability insurance. Get written bids with start and completion dates. And, you know, they're so busy right now with just here in Nashville and across the state a week ago or so we had high winds and I know everyone um, this started, all the arborists got very, very busy. Make sure cleanup and proper disposal is included get detailed contracts with signatures and ensure the company is qualified to do the work and they have safety procedures as well. So all those things are important. There's a lot of liability um, and you really want the arborist that's coming in to your yard, your property to know what they're doing. So that's important. Next. So one thing we know here in Nashville is, of course, we're losing a lot of our trees any anyway rate to old age, many of them just aging out. We have a lot of growth and development, so we're losing trees to developments. Um, but we don't want people to go, oh, we hate trees, we're not gonna replant. Just think of it in the woods too, when there's a lot of ash trees and when, when they demise, there's a lot of, of open area there um, that sunlight's going to be in and everyone's going to be rushing and all the plants are going to rush to be in that sunlight to grow. Well, we want our native native trees to grow there. We don't want it to be full of honeysuckle and privet and other invasives or aggressive plants. So, you know, that's another area where we need to be aware of um, where we need to replant to go in and plant in those open sunlight areas in our forest. But you know, we want to um, stress that trees improve air quality. They help us conserve energy and reduce the cost of energy. They reduce stormwater runoff. I'm in the Metro Stormwater Department. And um, the reason why trees are in stormwater is because they are a great remediator of, of runoff. And of course they provide a wildlife habitat and they provide natural character for our cities. So um, we just encourage people to to note that we don't want to go back and plant all one species of tree. We want to, you know, mon monoculture. We don't. We want a variety of trees um, to be planted back, and we want people to think about um, the mature height of that tree one day. And is is it the right tree in the right place? Be um, considerate of utility lines, and then um, keep your tree watering, uh, watered and mulched. And it's important during the growing season, um, which will be coming up soon, to, to water, to make sure your trees at least get an inch of water per week during the growing season. And then in times of drought, which we always seem to have 
um, two to three weeks every year um, or maybe twice a year a drought. So you really have to pay attention to those older trees even during that those drought times. Next. So how can you help? Talk with your family and friends and neighbors about the EAB epidemic. I know um, when I first put, was working with the Tree Advisory Committee on this presentation, we were going, wow, an epidemic. Never been in an epidemic. And then before you knew it, we were in a pandemic. So um, we're back to the epidemic. Um, we, we need all of you all to communicate um, about um, planting, planting trees in, in your neighbor's yards. You know, encourage your community. Volunteer. We have so many um, volunteer opportunities in Nashville to plant community trees. And um, got a lot of wonderful tree organizations out there just planting. We have a campaign in Nashville called Root Nashville to plant a half a million trees by 2050. And um, we're counting all those trees. We're mapping it on that website if, if you want to go to Root Nashville. And um, so we're, it's a lot of buzz right now about planting trees, which is a good thing. And then, of course, don't move firewood. Buy it where, um, buy it where you burn it. Again, that's how it got to, we believe, in the first sighting in Tennessee was a truck stop. Makes sense that someone was moving firewood from the north and came down and dropped it off there, and there you go. Um, you know, this is a big economical and ecological issue. Um, they estimate there's about uh, 8 billion ash in the United States. Um, the value is uh, over you know, $250 billion, because you have to treat, you know, remove, all this stuff has a, a economic impact. And then there's that loss to the environment. Um, here, we have a lot of, of white ash in our forest. Um, there's over 65 species overall. So um, we just wanna be thinking about how we can keep the diversity of our forest, because that depends on the forest health. Um, so when you're planting back, think of planting different types of trees. Okay, next. So um, one of the things that we do in Nationals, we have a program called Green Shirts where we train volunteers up to plant trees and to supervise other volunteers. And one of the main things that I just wanted to note here is that, you know, roots breathe. And so if you plant your tree too deep, the roots are gonna try to grow and they're gonna be shallow um, because they're trying to get to the, to the air. So just where that, the root collar comes down, it starts to come out, there should be the first root there. And where that first root is, should be about two inches above ground and it will settle some, but that will help prevent the tree from being planted too deep. Now, sometimes, especially in bald and burlap trees, you have to dig in um, and uncover where that first root is because the soil has been pushed up way up the trunk. So that's really important. And um, we talked about um, how important it is to water your tree. Um, and it's really the first three years why it's getting established. Those are the critical years for establishing the roots. Um, and then once the roots get established, then the tree feels confident to start growing upward. But um, those roots have to be, um, you know, you have to water to get those roots to be established. And that's really important. Next. And another way um, of replanting is by seedlings. And, you know, each person can grow their seedling up. But this is really a forestry approach where you plant, let's say, 100 seedlings and you have no intention of going back to water them. But um, if 70% of them live, then that's, that's a positive, successful story. Um, if you plant a seedling in your yard, you might want to tie a bright bow on its top so that you don't mow it over. It, it needs to be protected from, um, you know, even you planting it one week and going out and mowing it. I could see myself doing that. So just um, remember the um, different ideas about um, the landscape approach or the forestry approach, whatever, you know, this is a lot of the, um, after the 2010 floods throughout Davidson County and a little bit in Rutherford County, 
on the Division of Forestry went through and in the riparian areas on the, the edges of water, pond, lake, river, creek, whatever, and plant a lot of, of seedlings and they've grown up well. And they're really helping us um, to absorb the water where it, it, it is instead of getting into the rivers and creeks and rushing down stormwater management tool. Okay, next. And, and that's it. And I'm not sure if there's any questions. Um, I have a few minutes left on my schedule or time here. But um, again, um, go to the um, trees.nashville.gov to get the Emerald Ash Borer brochure. Again, the Metro Tree Advisory Committee, we wrote this with your neighbors. And it's, it's a practical way to deal with this epidemic. Um, this is a Louisville slugger and um, it's made out of ash wood. So um, I have been asked about can the wood in the middle, the pith, the hardwood be saved? Yes, it can be because um, the bores are on the outside in that live tissue. So, um, you know, if you have a way of, of saving it, um, the woods, you know, you don't want to take a you know, maybe you had a mule that could pull it out of the woods, but you don't want to bring in a big truck or something to destroy the other trees in the woods to get that pith wood out of there. So um, a lot of ways to think about this epidemic. All right, Jennifer, we had one question from Sean um, about is blue ash, are blue ash species still thought to be resistant to EAB? You know, um, there was some initial research on that. And I don't know if it's really come through either way. Um, from, from a, again, the way we approached it, um, we first started talking about blue ash, maybe not be resistant, um, but I mean, it's like the fringe, the native fringe tree, you know, it, it's potentially gonna be succumb to the emerald ash borer. Um, so what we did, because there's so few blue ash trees in our area, we didn't just start distinguish because we wanted all of our citizens to be, you know, not afraid to, to identify an ash tree. Um, but I do not know the most research, but I, there was some initial thought, and I'd heard that um, at one point that it, it was not um, proven out but I don't know if they fully have um, come back and said it was. That's kind of what I've heard as well. Yeah. And I think uh, back to the fringe tree, you know, we're just saying um, plant that non um, native fringe tree, but this isn't going to be like, um, a, you know, this isn't going to come here and eat all of our, our, ash trees and move on, there's going to be um, bores left here because the, some of the ash will produce suckers and stuff. So there'll be some in our community. Um, and so we think that once they go through all the ash, you know, they'll look at the, the fringe trees, you know, say, oh, here's some more. And, and think about this. In Asia, you know, this, this bore came from Asia. And there, they had a symbiotic relationship with the ash trees because um, they're not going to, the boar is not going to kill off its host because, it, you know, they, have, they grew up together. It's just when they brought it to this country, it's when the epidemic, uh, again, costing billions of dollars of loss um, and in value of, of care and taking down and then the ecology of what we're losing from our natural environment. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you talking about this. I know EAB has spread across, you know, a little over two thirds of the state now. So a lot of communities are dealing with this exact same thing. So it's yes. really good to hear that. And and I believe it was um, at one point Nashville had, I think it was like the sixth largest number of ash in our county and our state, but Shelby County was the highest by far. So um, it, it is something you have to get ahead of. And I will tell you, one of the first things we did, too, was we asked um, 
the urban forester from Knoxville. He came down and we got all of our departments and we got some city council members and someone from the mayor's office and we had a presentation on it. And um, Casey, he's, he, he had been in another city and then Knoxville, so he could show how to do it and how not to do it. And they really did a good job in Knoxville um, in dealing with this epidemic. But education, education, education. And, and it starts with educating your uh, elected officials because we have a master plan and it's millions of dollars. Um, we just got $5 million approved and it's gonna be taking down trees on the right of way in our parks and doing an inventory um, for our schools. But we already, since the beginning, we've done inventories in our parks and, and right of ways. Excellent. All right, to keep us on track, um, I think uh, we'll wrap up with you, Jennifer. Thank you for speaking. You're welcome. Um, and we'll go ahead and let Jesse get his presentation queued up. Um, so we're going to have our next speaker, uh, Jesse Webster, um, share about invasive plant management. Um, uh, Jesse works with uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park um, as a forester, veg management. You you can yeah, introduce yourself as well, um, but he's going to be sharing a bit about um, uh, their process of uh, managing invasive plants. All right, I can see your presentation. Um, I can't hear any audio yet, Jesse. I don't know if you're. How about now? All right, there we go. Yes, <laughs> that's the only audio I got is my voice. Um, but uh, thanks, Hannah. And uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the, the shout out about uh, not moving firewood. That's great. There's so many other uh, forest pests that we're concerned about getting into the park um, and the region that are vectored by firewood. So that was great. So yeah, if y'all can see this, um, presentation I'll get going here keep us on track but um uh invasive uh, plants it's a big a big topic here I just want to highlight a couple things you know um, there's a lot in in the management of that and we'll touch on a little bit of it but I really want to kind of discuss a little bit more about um I guess early detection and rapid response maybe for some agencies or municipalities things to be thinking about with some species as well um so moving on here um, uh, Hannah, no one mentioned resilient forest, so I, I don't believe so. I get to be uh, the one that actually can help maybe define that a little bit. Um, a lot, a lot of um, uh, discussion around now um, around uh, healthy ecosystems and, and resource management is um, centered around the, the idea of resilient forest. You hear the word resiliency everywhere now, right? Um, but what does it mean in a forest eco ecosystem? Um, and it's important to understand that really just the capacity for those forests to underline to absorb disturbance and change. So invasives love disturbance, right? You know, they're looking for that foothold to get started. Um, there's lots of disturbance and change on the landscape now um, with uh, climate change. So really having healthy forests that can absorb that um, also, while maintaining those similar ecosystem functions, uh, those important benefits that Jennifer mentioned to the community, um, uh, maintaining that composition and structure into the future, that's what a resilient forest is. Um, having a, re a abundant regenerate regeneration layer, so baby trees, um, baby plants that are there to, um, um, to follow suit um, in their parents' footsteps. Uh, diversity uh, in the campy layer um, with a range of size and cohorts. And they're not all the same um, species and they're not all the same age um, and also minimal impacts um, of anthropogenic stressors um, on the landscape. So that's that's really a resilient forest or forest resiliency defined. So um, what is the um, opposite of that? What does a, a non-resilient forest look like? Uh, this is just coming back from Park Service um, data that's coming in from inventory monitoring in the capital region. So mid-Atlantic and northeast regions as well, but I believe we all see this as a similar aspect in forest and in the east in general and the southeast. But if you notice, um, this is the um, and again, Kate Miller, um, she's with North Northeast region. She's an oncologist. Um, this is a great presentation she um, she laid out for some of their inventory monitoring folks. But she's really highlighting here with this yellow line. This is the browse line from deer. So I'm not going to go into deer management too much, but 
you know, this is an aspect that's affecting forests throughout the east, um, some places more than others. Um, but the the overabundance of um, deer might might be a reason for the lack of seedlings, right? So now, what are the tree species that are going to be there? Um, where this this you've got this healthy or had been a healthy oak forest, there's no more oak regeneration. Or there might might be other species of trees that aren't oak. So that's a mix mat a mi mix max mix max <laughs> getting that word out. Um, there's an um, uh, imbalance in that system, right? Um, so that's one one example of a concerning lack of uh, uh, you know I guess the resiliency in that system. Also add to that, and that really to highlight what I'm going to talk about um, on the rest of this presentation is that concerning lack of the seedling bank and the re, um, advanced regeneration regen coupled with invasives, right? So this is an example from a National Park Service unit um, in the Mid-Atlantic, Morristown. This is a hist historic site um, that um, Washington uh, overwintered with his troops. And here you have an example of the understory of nothing but um, bush honeysuckle, which we do have here, a lot of barberry. There's not a lot in, in, in the valley here in Tennessee. Um, but this is an example that Kate laid out here um, to where it was concerning to her in 2009. She really thought that, hey, there's some there's something going on here um, with with lack of regeneration. But really thinking, um, as we have with a lot of things, maybe with climate change as well, it's going to take a long time for this to make it to be an impact. I want you to uh, notice right here there's flagging from their monitoring point. Um, but then you get disturbance and you get change. And this is from, I believe, Hurricane Sandy in 2013. All right. And um, that's uh, some of that loss of canopy um, structure. Um, no seedlings in the understory. Um, focus on, again, this is the tree that that flagging, you know, had been on. Um, so uh, you've got a break in the canopy. And then um, with more sunlight, more barberry, more invasives. It's almost it becomes what's known as a um, a novel ecosystem. There's no more native uh, trees and plant species to to take over those those uh, gaps, right? And then you know, believe it or not, you think that that's the end, but it get it gets. And here's the flag tree as well. Same flag flagging, um, even high. You know, hard to believe, even taller. Um, Multiflora rose. Um, and other invasives. And that's really what they are seeing on the landscape. And I would say, you know, not necessarily um, in the park, but on the perimeters and in other areas of the valley, Tennessee Valley, this is happening. So it's something to take note of. Um, also, um, same flag tree in that plot, Kate mentioned, you know, for what we do in the Park Service and other agencies, how we manage it, what, you know, how are we um, accomplishing our mission? Um, we're losing the cultural, uh, the cultural as aspects of some of these parks as well. Um, you know, Washington's troops would not have been, um, you know, overwintering in these massive thickets. You know, they were open, um, healthy forest. Um, also, there's the now um, with the, some of these um, invasive shrub layers. You've got the uh, the increased aspect of um, of ticks. That's a known aspect. Um, vectoring, uh, vectoring diseases. So there's um, um, you know, safety issues as well. Um, and then the loss of those ecosystem functions that Jennifer mentioned. So all in all, not the trend that we want to see on the landscape. So what I want to get back to, how do we get back to resilient forest um, and keeping them that way? I'm not going to talk about deer management. Um, something to think about though. We've heard a little bit about um, tree, treating trees for um, forest insects. I'm not going to talk about um, fire on the landscape, which is important. I believe, uh, I guess that was Jackie headed out to do some uh, controlled burns, which is awesome. I'm going to talk about um, invasive species, plant species control. That's the one I'm going to um, focus on. So let's hate on some calorie pairs, y'all. Uh, what I wanted to pick out were a couple of species um, and a couple things to highlight. So many of our species that we are actively trying to control to impact our landscape were brought here and cared for um, originally. So we were the ones, um, humans are the ones that brought this upon ourselves. Of note, this is from Dr. Frank Meyer. He developed the Meyer lemon, it was of note. He was the USDA, um, the plant explorer. So now USDA works on keeping plants out of the country. Then they worked on trying to find novel plants to bring into the country. And he noted that calorie pair, um, very few trees find pine trees, meaning really dry, 
marginal sites um, find them congenial mates, but this remarkable calorie pair occurs at times quite plentiful in open pine forests and even on sterile mountain slopes. And we found out, you know, this is a picture uh, around Knoxville and probably all the way to, to uh, Nashville, right, Hannah? I'm not sure calorie pear is really, really sticking its sore thumb out. And I think nobody really enjoys pr planting Bradford pears now because they um, they all look look alike and they want something different. But two things I'm highlighting here. Um, we bring these plants in, and also there's a time to focus on all of these um, invasives, a time of the season that they all want either show themselves or they're more readily receptive to control. So that's something to really highlight. Other one, you know, the way I talk about invasives with a lot of the public, it's uh, kudzu, right? It's the the, the poster child for um, for invasive species. Yeah, there might be an ice cream wagon in here somewhere. It's buried. Um, but this is the picture that a lot of folks have of kudzu. Um, but again, first brought into the U.S. as an ornamental because of the sweet smelling flowers and um, folks found it uh, fascinating and also used for erosion control. Um, a time for treating kudzu, you know, um, of the 150 sites that we have in the park, um, you know, well over 80% of those, 90% of those have been eradicated. Um, kudzu is actually easy to control. Um, a lot of folks find that fascinating. There's different techniques, but we'll We'll smell it out in August. You know, we're we're out in the backcountry, and you can actually catch a whiff of whiff, whiff of kudzu. Smells like great Kool Aid. Um, that's one way we can zero in on it. Um, so on to how we control. Again, I'm not going to get into the the weeds on the 75 non-native invasive plant species. We have over 400 non-native plants in the Smokies, but only 75 of them we consider invasive. Really, about you know 40 or 50 that we are. And, you know, around the years, you know, um, on a different calendar cycle, actively controlling, but that's two main forms of mechanical um, hand pulling and also chemical. So there's mechanical and chemical hand pulling. Uh, mechanical, you can use utilize tools as well. Great group of volunteers. We had out a couple, well, just, just last week, uh, see, um, Sevier County seniors pulled a mountain of uh, English ivy. Looks like uh, cousin it right here. Um, so we, we utilize volunteers. Um, and also a mechanical, talk back to kudzu, you got to get it out of the trees first. So it's su super easy to actually, it's a vining, it's not, doesn't attach to the tree. So just cutting it out of the trees first and then moving on to the chemical treatment. I want to highlight two species. I'm always asked which are the ones that are most difficult in Smokies. The ones that really irritate me the most are, um, are um, Japanese honeysuckle. Um, smells great. Um, you know, a lot of folks remember that from uh, being a kid. But really, it's uh, pernicious in our wetlands. So it's something that we um, we we have uh, difficulty with. But we uh, spend a lot of time on on honeysuckle, um, especially in those wetlands. Um, it's impacting native plants. But uh, a big part of that is um, mechanical, and then chemical. Some chemicals um, spraying in the winter time. And that leads me on to the active ingredients. Um, the two main ones that we utilize are glyphosate and triclopyr. Um, it's Roundup, right? You know, it's Roundup with the glyphosate, typically it's what folks are familiar with. So we we do utilize chemical control. Um, uh, another species to highlight, um, winter creeper. Um, you know, it, it's time to to really show itself it, um, as now it was brought into the country, as was honeysuckle, um, as an ornamental. Um, right now, you can still foliar spray it without impacting native um, wildflowers. So we're, we're, we're out. You know, and a lot of people have the aspect or idea of invasive control with a backpack sprayer. Very little of what we do in the park is backpack spraying. You can get an initial coverage of a site, but then after that, you're moving on to, you know, one that, and this this is an example of, of a basal application where you can actually, you know, you can think of about a chemical, chemical girdling just sprayed on the base of the tree or plant, and then also cut stump. And this is probably 80% of what we do you cut the plant and then you're just applying a small amount of chemical herbicide to the to the active uh, cambium layer of the tree. I'd like to highlight for folks, this is something we picked up pretty recently. Um, Daubers, um, Naisma group uh, out of Montana, they're an invasive group. Um, they sell these, they're, they're really durable, rugged, um, and it really reduces the amount of chemical on, on the landscape. And, and it's really basically a bingo dauber, right? Um, it's a tiny, tiny amount of chemicals, all you need to really, uh, and then you don't have the, the impacts, um, 
uh, into the soil or on, and onto other plants. But as um, Jackie mentioned, the integrated pest management approach and the take home to all of this um, with invasive control in the park is that pests can continue on the landscape at tolerable, tolerable levels. We're not trying to absolutely eradicate every single honeysuckle in the park. We want to make it tolerable to our native plants and, and, and those native plant communities and the animals, um, pollinators, and wildlife that rely on them. So that's our goal. Um, and we do and we do reach that. Um, so invasives and in all plants are, you know, majority of them spread by seed. Um, you know, there's nothing really can do about wind and, and birds doing that um, dispersion. But there is something that we we in the park, we know and we can think about it as homeowners, homeowners as well as, you know, how are these things getting here? Um, you know, we know they're coming in on construction equipment, um, seed, obviously, like um, um, mulch and grass seed and also on our hiking boots and clothing. So the vectors, how are they actually getting to the park? Um, so that's getting into the really into the rapid detection. So early detection and rapid response aspect of this I want to talk about. So we monitor construction um, in the park. So gravel and fill material, we, we uh, monitor the, um, the quarries that it's coming from, make recommendations on ones to utilize. Um, we're thinking about trailheads and campgrounds, old home sites, where people have been. Again, it's where that disturbance is happening. Um, you know, you can think about that along roadsides um, where any debris is pushed up and uh, dumped. Burned areas, burns, um, even uh, wildfires, uh, unnatural fire, or controlled fires can create that disturbance. Um, and you've got tornadoes, the list derecho, which is a straight line wind, and landslides. Those are all areas where you're going to see, um, you're going to see invasives pop up. Now, if you, the, the big picture as well, if you maintain um, and and suppress them for uh, a while, a few years, depending on the species, as the native plant component takes hold, you've got a lot better chance on keeping that resilient understory seed bank in the future. So I guess uh, this um, slide is really thinking about how we, we work with our um, our roads and our facilities folks when we think about the weediness of uh, you know what we're looking at coming into the park. So yeah, if it's gonna be asphalted over and that's not what we're recommending, but we're really not concerned on areas where we're getting um, hard pack concrete, crushed bedrock. It's one when the soil is coming in, right? That's really a big, a big risk for us, maybe risk for municipalities or also areas where you just wanna focus on um, maybe native plant um, uh, propagation in those areas to get a good foothold. Um, so common weeds that you're going to see coming in on those, um, Colt's foot, um, I have a photo of that. don't know how familiar you're, you're all, everyone might be with that, but it's really like the, it's the dandelion of the 21st century. It's pretty nasty and it's an example of, um, it's an example of early detection. If we see that in the park, we're going to get on it ASAP and we want to put it out like a wildfire. So there are some of these garlic mustard, um, Napweed, even Johnson grass um, can get, you know, over time can get rough, rough in some of the, the fields. So these are some of the ones where we see garlic mustard is, it can get really nasty. I've seen some um, areas in the mid Atlantic that we do not want here. Um, so we hit them, we hit them fast and hard um, and knock that population pressure down. Um, Colts foot and quarry. So this is an example of the, that material that gets um, broken off in, in loose gravel. And yeah, it's, it's scooped up and moved over um, onto construction sites. Again, as a dandelion, um, imagine winds that are carrying, you know, millions upon millions of these seeds that could be happening in your area if you're not quick to get these things knocked down. Um, also, a lot of these species, this is just the example. There's a nice picture of the colts, but it's um, of interest is that the flowers come out before the leaves. I mean, only flowers, and then leaves die back. I mean, the flowers will die back, and then you'll get the leaves out. So, control on that one is just uh, heading off the flowers, and then a foliar spray on the leaf. But the root system is, um, yeah, it's um, extensive, and one small piece of that can actually generate another plant. So, you want to make sure to get um, you know, that chemical control is actually systemic treatment on it. All right, and also um, uh, in uh, you know in areas where you have uh, those uh, intense burns, you know we're we're um, 
quick to get to those areas as well, patrol them for invasives. Um, Crown Vetch, an uh, example of one that came in con on contaminated hydro seed material. Um, we're thinking about, you know, we have a park blend, and as you can utilize in, in, at home in municipal areas as well, that might just be, you just need a, a, um, a covering of, of an annual rye, for example, or even some, even some of the fescues, not, um, not the um, tall fescues, but some of the, the lower, the lower formed um, red fescue, hard fescues, they are native, um, you know, and they can, and they are, they can be purchased at local co-ops. And the idea is, is that you just get a foothold, keep that soil in place as native plants become established. Um, it's one good take. All right, so um, yeah, invasives work is hard, right? And I think this is a hard work. And some folks come to the park and they say, you've got the best job in the world. And we say, well, you're not, you're not here when the lightning's striking or the yellow jackets are out. And I think um, this is a photo of Renee right after she looks a little shell shocked from getting a, a yellow jacket um, attack. But um, it's something that you know we do, we believe in, um, and you got to have uh, you got to have the understanding and the belief that you are making a difference. And and I'll highlight one more time before I'm done: you have to have uh, the ability to get back to these sites. If you choose to take on invasive control, you need to get back to those areas, or you just make them mad. Right, because you were basically creating more disturbance by initial eradication efforts. So you need to have an ability, a methodical ability to revisit those sites. It might even be on a three-year rotation, and you know, might just be two people um, for a couple of days or a half a day. Um, you you work it out. There's a resources at the end. I'm going to show you here that that highlight um, the life cycle of, of many of these species. But something to think about. You got to have the stick with itness to get back there and do it, and it works. Um, garlic mustard, um, it's got the allelopathic tendency, meaning a lot of a, plant, a lot of plants have that. They produce chemicals that combat other plants, um, prevent them from um, actually uh, establishing a foot foothold. Garlic mustard's really good at it. So is tree of heaven. Um, native walnut is as well. That's something to note. But they, the, the underlying thing here should have underlined is that they all displace native plants, right? And that's what you're gonna get is this monoculture of uh, garlic mustard. Garlic mustard first brought into the, into the States um, from Europe as a food source um, of interest, you know? So you can, you can utilize this as uh, grains, um, cooked up some grains with your ham hocks. It's pretty good, done it. It's got a little garlic, well, garlic, garlicky mustard. Um, so talking about um, how we go about these sites, you know, we can track and point when we're on the landscape. Um, examples of the numbers of plants that we were removing in an area, we were on a trend line down, but then not to get disheartened, we find another, you know, another watershed that, where there had been some more garlic, garlic mustard. So those, those numbers do go, go back up. But a lot of these species really respond to that constant pressure. Um, it takes like with the ones I highlighted with kudzu and uh, cow repair, it takes a long time for these species to get started, establish a foothold. It's going to take some time to get them out. Um, so we also, in our NEPA process um, and mitigations in the park, this is just an example of a lot of our projects that we have um, uh, with uh, uh, some of the, well, an example might be some of the, the recent parking parking permits that we've got going in the Smokies now um, that are really beneficial, very helpful for the park. Um, they needed establishment of a lot of um, um, some barriers that were placed in the ground. So um, in that, the imported material, we want to make sure it's it's weed free. Um, here's another one right here, burdock at AT shelters. Um, they're introduced by horse campers. So, you know, think about, you know, we're not going to prevent horses, you know, from um, transporting seed up there in their gut and that's really what happened but you know we have the ability to to, to just uh on a once every couple of year basis you know um do that hike along those at shelters and we're able to, to knock those things out um everybody's familiar with burdock or you know cockleburros right um so tornadoes um massive disturbance in the park 2011 uh 14 mile wide path i can't do anything about that but we were able to actually you know, the very few species that are in the deep forest um, that can occupy those areas, uh, Polonia and, and um, 
and uh, Colts foot tree of heaven. We want to make a we want to make a we don't want to make a push through those areas just for a couple of years, um, if possible, right? Um, and again, back to there might be some in there, but it's not you know we want to we want to reduce the um, the major threats. Um, high severity burns. This is a, a photo of the the um, Sevier County and uh, Gatlinburg wildfires. So obviously the red is the 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 most severe areas. So those are the areas where we actually um, scout. So this is an, an example of the trail system and our work that we that the park helps us with um, helps fund through burned area restoration um, projects. Is we actually will. You know, you can see our track layers here with our GPS units where we're scouting those areas for invasives. Um, there's a picture of Polonia, some of those fire sites. So you get that thing. We've got um, research documented. You knock that down for a few years, get canopy closure from native tree species. Um, you're you're doing a lot better. Um, here's Colts foot flowered uh, seeding out. Notice no leaves yet. So, you know, these get wind born. We want to make sure we're knocking those out. Um, we, we scout that area for four years. We went through them um, along the trail systems in the Gatlinburg fire area. Um, so uh, wrapping stuff up here, we utilize volunteers. We have a permanent staff. We're fortunate to do that, but we utilize ACE crews, um, SECC crews, young, young folks, larger crews, 10, 15 people at a time sometimes for these areas. It's a great area for volunteer groups um, in the community. If you want to think about um, coordinating um, coordinating that. Um, it's a great idea to take before and after pictures. Here's a Foothills Parkway area with Mimosa in the fall and then the work after the ACE crew come, comes through. So making a big difference. Um, you know, we have our database that, that these numbers do go into. And again, you can get into the details on showing these trend lines, but it, um, you know, it works. Uh, you just got to have that stick with itness and, and um, get back, get back to itness on it. So it's all important. Um, and that's what I'll get back to one more time is just saying, hey, proactive stewardship. And that's what we're talking about is having a hand in keeping forest resilience resilient. It actually works, but you got to have the stick with itness, right? Um, here's the daubers, some of the um, folks on the ACE crew using those new daubers we got. So I want to highlight, it's just not me talking. It's the research behind this um, work that the Forest Service did on removing Japanese privet in a riparian area. No, this is just one hit, right? So they did a, they did a pretty heavy handed area um, uh, in different quadrants and they looked at that versus um, uh, reference sites. And one hit, even five years later, has positive benefits for pollinators, meaning more pollinators um, in that area. So you imagine if you get that, um, work that into a program where you're able to get back, um, you know, time and time again, prioritizing your areas, right? And that's, that's really important to, to note. Um, so on that, um, you know, one one interesting note is we've been able to utilize iNaturalist. There's a pr project um, that we've got created with the park boundary where, you know, folks are actually finding something that's not on our radar. It's going into iNaturalist, one of these newer apps. It um, it actually pops up, which is awesome. Um, if it's outside of our database, um, we can highlight that and get some folks up there and, and do something about it. Um, we're highlighting here. Uh, next bullet is. Um, garlic mustard ladies. So we've got some folks that actually get out um, that report back to us. They know what we're looking for and they've got some hikes that they do. Um, and, you know, they're part of that volunteer group that we can coordinate. Uh, knowing that you want to, especially in, in, in sensitive areas, meaning areas with uh, unique um, rare plants um, and native plants in general, you want to make sure that these groups, um, I think this is the last one, everyone knows how to properly report, identify, and they're reporting to the right person. It gets back to that stick with itness. You really don't want to. You want to have a methodical approach to all of this um, as you're working sites, and also that that information is being collected and those species are being identified and correctly. You know, and it takes and that it takes folks, it takes you know individuals to do that. And that's something that maybe you could bring up to elected officials, right? On some areas, maybe in towns where we have these green greenways and green belts, those are excellent examples of um, areas where the um, public can get to work. Uh, they want to do that and they see a benefit in it. They just need someone to actually help help shepherd that along. And with that, um, just want to highlight that, you know, there's something we can all do. Uh, a lot of these invasives can be overwhelming to people at first, but really um, you just got to get, I mean, you got to get started on it. Um, and also I think uh, maybe on this last slide here, yeah, um, 
uh, Tennessee Invasive Plant Council, if you go to this link, um, not only do they talk about invasive plants, but they really highlight native plants that can be utilized um, to replace um, non-native invasive plants. So on that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Jesse, for the presentation. I actually have a quick question while folks are typing whatever they Good. Whatever that was a lot. That was have. a lot of silence there. All right. <laughs> um, so as far as um, like long term management strategies, um, I know we talk about integrated pest management for invasive plants and integrated pest management for HWA at the park. What are y'all doing? Because I know y'all manage HWA and all those other pests. How do you prioritize managing plants versus insects? You know, the the large scale oh, invasive uh, plant one management one over the for other. All yeah. Pests. Well, no, they, and that's back to the integrated pest management. Um, um, you know, the five principles. One of those is you need to incorporate the ecosystem as the whole unit, right? So those things will feed, and that's going to feed back to you. And it's, I can't think of an example top of my head, but you need to think about, um, yeah, with some of these, uh, they might, here's, here you go, um, hemlocks die, they create those, oh, they create those canopy gaps, um, especially if they're in, in, uh, near the edge of the park where we have a, a known infestation issue right across the street. And that's an example that we have, you know, um, and sometimes people say, well, the park's just an island, you know, of this, of these, you um, you know, these plant communities. And I was like, well, it is. And that's one of our missions, you know, but we work with the state and we work with the Forest Service as well to make these corridors. So that's an example of how we how we think maybe about the the whole ecosystem as the unit. OK, and, uh, and Hannah, can you help me with, the, with any chats? Yeah, and so so it sounds like Jim was asking um, who makes those daubers. Oh, yeah. So those are um, those go out um, from. NAISMA, N-A-I-S-M-A, -S North American Invasive Species Management Association. Pretty darn close if it's not, but you can check those out. Their group um, up in the Midwest, um, they've got some other, they have that, um, they have that Play, Play Clean Go um, project out now, and they work on, you know, the aspects of um, uh, mulch and soils and also um, quarries, and they're working with other states on developing more of a, um, an overarching um, an approach to, um, I guess, uh, certification on quarries, right? And certification on, you know, quarries want to do the right thing, and they, you know, they know if if folks are are concerned about invasives, you know, that they want to go to the the best one and the ones that are clean clean quarries. So, you know, nasma has got those daubers. They're great. I think that's. I think if more people are using those. It's gonna be great. And then the next question from Kendall was when you remove kudzu, do you just leave the rest in the tree after you cut the stump? Oh, yeah, most definitely. So, again, it's a um, we might have been talking about this the other day. And, you know, it's your it's your twining vine. Right. So it doesn't have those like, you know, you think about, um, you know, um, native uh, Virginia creeper. But, you know, it doesn't it doesn't attach or like, you know, my my nemesis is, uh, you know, the the winter creeper it doesn't attach to the stem of the tree, right? It just kind of binds up. It needs lower branches to actually grab onto and start doing, you know, even though it can, what, it can stand up at like eight feet tall and swing around and find, find one of those. But cut it, it's going to die in the tree. And then you can get back to that. Um, so kudzu, um, you get back to a foliar application, really light foliar app application, and then you're on to cut stump later on. So instead of the hatchet approach, you're into the more of the scalpel. I um, mean, kudzu can be eradicated on the landscape. It just takes a little bit of stick with it. Excellent. Any last questions for Jesse while we've got him here? If not, uh, I really appreciate you talking for uh, a bit about all the invasive plant work y'all have done. and. Um, I guess Cindy is on, so we can go ahead and start getting her geared up to present. Thanks, Jesse.
All right. All right. Let's see if we can get this sharing here. Excellent. I see it. <laughs> All right, because I've got so many screens, I can't tell you which screen is coming from. And you can hear me as well, so that's good. Yes, ma'am. Yep. All right. Let me rearrange just a little bit. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, my name is Cindy Bilbury, and I have just been appointed as state entomologist. I've been with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture in the plant certification section for a long time, but I'm in a new position. So uh, I haven't presented in a little while, so let's let's try to make it a, a good presentation. Uh, let's see. Um, so within plant certification reside the nursery, greenhouse, plant dealer, and landscaper certification programs, as well as um, our apiary section and our hemp section. Uh, we work with industries to con ensure continued movement of healthy, pest-free plant material and interstate and international trade and monitor the phytosanitary conditions of plant materials that are coming into the state. We also survey for pests of concern that, um, that may be coming in uh, to determine what types of, of plants and pest concerns there will be on exports. Um, there are lots of different kinds of invasive species. There are currently 104 pests on the national uh, priority pest list. Uh, and they can come in different forms. We have insects, diseases, mollusks, and also nematodes on that list. I'm just going to talk to you about a few of the pests that we don't have in Tennessee, but that we are watching for. Um, we do have a lot of international trade um, coming and going from within the state. Uh, our pests can move on those things and also on hitchhikers um, like campers and, and, and cars and things like that from areas within the U.S. Um, they can move, pests can also move on nursery stock. Um, they can spread naturally and they can move on firewood. The first one I want to talk about is Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this little guy is an interesting bug. He is only been found in about four states in the U.S. And in areas that they, they're found, they do a lot of damage. Um, their main host is maple, but there is also a laundry list of other species that they can get on. Um. So here's the list. Uh, they're found in New York, Ohio, Massachusetts, and South Carolina. And they can be on ash, birch, elm, golden rain tree, London plain tree, maple, horse chestnut and buckeye, katsura, mimosa, mountain ash, poplar, and willow. Um, that's a pretty wide host range. I had the opportunity to uh, go to South Carolina and work with the folks there on the infestation and do some uh, tree research out there in the in the forest. Um, it's an amazing little creature, um, but it does a lot of damage on our maples. Uh, so the the larva is the part of the life cycle that does the most damage. Um, and this this little thing here will show us uh, an adult emerging from an exit hole in the spring. The adults don't live very long, but the the larva is the is the big problem and the larvae are in they have one generation per year 
Um, so the larva is in that tree for a long time. All right, let's see if we can't get to this one. So uh, the adults emerge and they have a round exit hole. The exit hole is pretty big. Um, you can stick a pencil in that hole is how big it is. Um, this section over here is an area that uh, the adult is going to go and chew a little hole and lay her egg right in that in that little spot right there. Um, this one is probably a little bit older. So in the in the spring, once they emerge, you'll you'll find these little little feeding pits. Uh, as they get older and grow uh, bigger, they're going to be expelling frass or from from their holes uh, as they as they chew through the tree. In areas that they are, they're pretty heavy. Um, and they can do a lot of damage pretty quickly on on some maple trees. So what do they look like um, compared to some of the other pests that we have? Uh, Asian, the Asian longhorn beetle is this one here. It looks pretty similar to our cottonwood borer and um, white pine sawyer uh, and also the northern pine sawyer. The differentiation would be the uh, the coloration of the antenna. Um, all longhorn beetles have antenna that are longer than their body. Spotted lanternfly. We have not found a spotted lanternfly in Tennessee as of yet, um, but it is knocking at our door. Um, we have, they've found it in North Carolina and also Virginia. Um, we are gonna be putting some traps out this year to look for spotted lanternfly. Um, we have also put out traps in the past couple of years and have not found them. This little guy is an amazing bug. He's so pretty, but he can do a lot of damage. He's been found in 14 states including Connecticut, Delaware, Indiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Virginia, and West Virginia. It was first found in Pennsylvania and uh, the state of Pennsylvania and the USDA are doing everything they can to reduce the populations in that area. Um, it, Originally, they thought its main host was the Tree of Heaven or Alanthus, which is found growing everywhere. Um, and so they decided that they would try to eliminate Alanthus in that area in Pennsylvania. Um, but then now they know that uh, the spotted lanternfly can uh, reproduce on other uh, tree species. So they are kind of changing gears on that. Uh, and going more towards um, treating the actual bug than um, rather than uh, trying to eliminate the uh, the tree of heaven. Spotted lanternfly feed on many hosts. Um, the biggest concern uh, are the are the grapevines. There's a lot of uh, grape growing areas, wine growing areas within the U.S. and also within Tennessee. Um, but spotted lanternfly can also feed on almonds, apples, apricots, cherries, hops, maple, nectarines, oaks, peaches, pine, plums, poplar, sycamore, walnut, and willow. So the life cycle. The adult is going to lay an egg mass, and it looks just like a little bitty mud patch on a tree or on the side of your car or your camper or it, they can lay on just about anything with a relatively flat surface. Um, that's the problem with transportation. Um, if you are in an area where the adults are flying, 
um, and they lay eggs and you don't realize that their egg mass has been laid on your car or, or something like that. Um, and then you travel to another area and that egg mass hatches, um, you can start a new infestation. When the eggs hatch, they are um, their first instar is uh, black with white spots. And then as they grow, they kind of change in color. Their fourth instar is red with white spots. Um, and then the adults uh, emerge in, in the summer and are around for quite a while um, and, and lay lots of eggs. Populations can get pretty high in areas. Um, if you see a, all of these spotted lantern fly on this tree, um, they're going to be, um, they have piercing sucking mouth parts. They are um, hemiptera or uh, in, the, in the true bug family. And so they have piercing sucking mouth parts and they are going to suck the juice out of your trees or your fruit, vine, your vines or your fruit trees. Um, the egg masses uh, look a little bit like mud in the spring and then they kind of dry out. And so it, it, by spring, they can look a little bit different than they were laid in the fall. Um, part of the uh, elimination of this bug is to try and scrape these egg masses. Um, it's, it's a really cool experience when you can go in there and scrape those egg masses and feel that pop of each egg being um, destroyed. The more egg masses you can eliminate, the less uh, adults you will have in the spring. Like I said, they can lay their egg masses on just about anything, uh, outdoor furniture, vehicles, uh, Originally, it was a concern on uh, Pennsylvania bluestone, where they shipped stone out of that original area, and they were concerned that they were moving egg masses with that stone. What could you confuse the spotted lanternfly with? There's a lot of bugs out there that have a little bit of red on them. Um, they're about the same size as the cicada. Uh, the leopard moth has got spots, milkweed bugs got some some red, you know, um, they, 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 they can be confused with a few different other things. Um, but if you see them, if you see a pre pretty big population, you'll know what it is. Um, if you see something like this, please report it. We want to know if it is in Tennessee. We've got a special email, um, spotted.lanternfly at tn.gov that we would like um, initial reports to come to. Box tree moth. Box tree moth um, is native to Asia and it's been found in Europe. It was found in an area in Canada in 2020. Um, and uh, it is a problem on boxwoods and also uh, ivy. No, not ivy. Uh, holly. Um, this bug was found on some boxwoods that were shipped into Tennessee from Canada. So we're putting out some traps to try and make sure that it does that this bug does not get established in Tennessee. This one was in the wrong place. Um, in North Carolina, they have a uh, a couple of dogs actually that are um, detector dogs for spotted lanternfly. Um, I, I had the opportunity to go and work with these folks, and these dogs can smell. The spotted lanternfly egg masses. It's, it was a really neat experience, and hopefully, they are doing their job and helping to eliminate the uh, spotted lanternfly in North Carolina. Here's our list of box tree moth hosts, mostly boxwood, but also euonymus um, and holly, uh, also Chinese privet is on that list in orange jasmine. 
the uh, the life cycle of the box moth. They lay eggs and turn into a caterpillar and pupate in a short period of time. Um, the the males are a lot smaller than the females. As they grow, as the caterpillar grows, uh, they can feed quite aggressively and uh, they can feed on everything except for that mid vein of the leaf. They are also going to leave a lot of webbing in the middle of your boxwoods. So that could be a telltale sign that you've got box tree moths. The caterpillars in the, in the pupa are, are really good at camouflaging, but it's hard to camouflage all this uh, webbing. So in May of 2021, APHIS issued a federal order to halt the importation of host plants from Canada into the U.S. Um, and we've, we've talked about that where they had a, an infestation in Canada and then plant material was shipped into um, multiple states um, and Tennessee was included in that. Box tree moth lookalikes. A, a, a tricky thing about box tree moth is there is a uh, a light morph, but there is also a dark moth. So um, this is also a box tree moth. It's just a darker morph. Lot, lots of moths look fairly similar. Um, so if you see something of concern, please let us know and we'll get that identified. And hopefully we will not find this in Tennessee. The elm zigzag sawfly. This is pretty new as well. Um, it was first detected in Canada in 2020. Um, but by 20 in 2021, it was found in Virginia. And by 2022, it's been found in North Carolina, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New York. This little guy looks like a caterpillar. Um, so you would think you could treat him like a caterpillar. Um, but if you use BT, it's not going to work. Um, Sawflies are, uh, are not caterpillars. So I think uh, they have been looking at... Um, Bovaria bassiana as as a treatment for this. Um, it, and the telltale sign is that it leaves a zigzag pattern um, when the larvae are small. Here's your adult zigzag soft lie. Um, they are native to East Asia, including Japan, Russia, Russia, Eastern China, and the Korean Peninsula. There are multiple generations per year possible in the U.S. Um, they say in the lab, they've reared um, up to seven generations per year, but they haven't been able to um, find more than four generations per year in the, in the forest. Um, still, that's a lot of generations. That's a lot of defoliation. Um, it can do a lot of damage on our elms. Beech leaf disease. This is uh, another new one to be on the lookout for. Um, it is actually a foliar nematode. The nematodes stay within the veins of the tree, so uh, of the leaf. So you can have areas of the leaf that are damaged and then areas of the leaf that are fine. It was first found in Ohio in 2012 and is now known to occur in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, West Virginia, and Ontario. Um, beach leaf disease can be found on American beach in the U.S., 
um, but it's also known to occur on Oriental and Chinese beach, beach in Europe. So if they have, um, if folks have planted them ornamentally, um, we need to be on the lookout for that as well on, on those species. Brown garden snail. Um, so we're on the mollusks. This brown garden snail is a problem on the West Coast. It's been found in Ohio. No, not Ohio. It's been found in Oregon and California. Um, and those states have to have special uh, inspections and compliance agreements if they are shipping um, nursery stock to Tennessee to avoid bringing these folks into our into our state. Um, the brown garden snail can feed on just about anything. Um, shrubs, vegetables, trees, fruit trees, flowers, grains. Um, so we really don't want to have this established here. Um, populations can get extremely high in, in areas that, that they are living. They can do a lot of damage uh, on on our tree species, but as well as our other other types of plants, fruits and and ornamentals. Brown garden snails can also be found in the food trade, and they can move in in that way, or also um, with nursery stock. Here are a few other lookalikes. Snails are are tricky, um, and if you think you have one of these, please let us know. We can determine um, whether it is truly the brown garden snail or not. Asian giant hornet. Um, it is native to the tropical East Asia, South Asia, mainland, Southeast Asia, and parts of Russia. It was found in Washington state, um, but we have not found it in Tennessee. And it feeds on honeybees. Hmm. Let's see if we can make this run here. All right, I'm confused as what happened here. Okay, there we go. Um, so the giant Asian hornet is pretty big. Um, it compares in size to uh, the Eastern cicada killer. Uh, European hornet is gonna be a little bit smaller, um, but hopefully we'll, we will not find this Asian giant hornet. in Tennessee. Phytophthora remorum is a disease that uh, it has been a problem on the West Coast as well. Um, it is the causal agent for sudden oak death. And we do have a lot of Phytophthora species in Tennessee, but we do not have this one. Um, if it establishes in in our forests, it can be a big problem on uh, on oaks, and it can be a big problem for our export 
uh, of oaks as well. And I don't think we're going to play that video today. Um, it, the sudden oak death has been established in, uh, in nursery stock in Oregon and California. And so uh, each year we do surveys to determine um, whether stock coming from that area ha is infested with the uh, Phytophthora remorum or not. On uh, shrubs, it can be just a uh, a leaf spot, um, but on on live oak trees and tan oak trees, it can be um, it can be deadly. So when we take samples, we just look at things that are um, are leaf spots, or um, there's a shepherd's crook or something like that of concern. Um, we'll take a sample, bring it back to the lab, and um, run an ELISA test to test for Phytophthora. We also have um, firewood quarantine. So we recommend that folks that are burning firewood burn local. If they cannot burn local, any firewood that is purchased from outside the state must be heat treated before it can be um, before it can be sold in the state. We try to do a lot of outreach to let folks know what pests we're looking for. We're also surveying for multiple pests within the state on a regular basis. And um, our goal is to train folks as to what kind of pests we're looking for. So don't move firewood, shop local, check before you wreck yourself and everybody else. And that's all I've got. If you've got any questions, I can take them now. Um, if you have seen any of those pests or if you need more information on any um, pests and diseases within the nursery, give me a call or send me an email. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, one thing, the audio for that Vinvasive video didn't play, but if you have the link for that video, if it was on YouTube, you could share the link in the chat. Okay. And then it looked like Jesse had a question about um, spotted lanternfly and wild grape. Has there been much um, looking at the impacts of spotted lanternfly on that, you know, soft mass species in forest settings at all? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I would imagine that we would know it would be here before we would find it in the forests. Um, but I, I don't know what research has been done on that. Sounds good. I appreciate you sharing all the information, and I know we get plenty of calls and emails about lookalikes of these pests, but I'm just grateful that we've got folks keeping an eye out for all these things. I know Sean mentioned that uh, we've had plenty of folks thinking we've got Asian giant hornet, and a lot of it are the cicada killers and things like that, so but good that folks are keeping an eye out for it. Um, any additional questions for Cindy? If not, I know you unpacked a lot of, uh, gave us a quick overview of a lot of different pests and pathogens and other issues. So I, I know it was kind of a whirlwind tour of, of the emerging um, threats we have, but um, 
it's also kind of a downer because there's so many different things that we're keeping an eye out on, but I'm glad that you're uh, with us as the state entomologist now and, and working on all that. Um, if we don't have any other questions for Cindy,